If I were compelled to accept one of these theories I would prefer the first, for if we can chase the germ of life off this planet and get it out into space we can guess the rest of the way and no one can contradict us, but if we accept the doctrine of spontaneous generation we cannot explain why spontaneous generation ceased to act after the first germ was created. Go back as far as we may, we cannot escape from the creative act, and it is just as easy for me to believe that God created man as he is as to believe that, millions of years ago, he created a germ of life and endowed it with power to develop into all that we see to day. I object to the Darwinian theory, until more conclusive proof is produced, because I fear we shall lose the consciousness of God's presence in our daily life, if we must accept the theory that through all the ages no spiritual force has touched the life of man or shaped the destiny of nations. But there is another objection. The Darwinian theory represents man as reaching his present perfection by the operation of the law of hate, the merciless law by which the strong crowd out and kill off the weak. If this is the law of our development then, if there is any logic that can bind the human mind, we shall turn backward toward the beast in proportion as we substitute the law of love. I prefer to believe that love rather than hatred is the law of development. How can hatred be the law of development when nations have advanced in proportion as they have departed from that law and adopted the law of love? But, I repeat, while I do not accept the Darwinian theory I shall not quarrel with you about it, I only refer to it to remind you that it does not solve the mystery of life or explain human progress. I fear that some have accepted it in the hope of escaping from the miracle, but why should the miracle frighten us? And yet I am inclined to think that it is one of the test questions with the Christian. Christ cannot be separated from the miraculous, his birth, his ministrations, and his resurrection, all involve the miraculous, and the change which his religion works in the human heart is a continuing miracle. Eliminate the miracles and Christ becomes merely a human being and his gospel is stripped of divine authority. The miracle raises two questions can God perform a miracle, and, would he want to? The first is easy to answer. A God who can make a world can do anything he wants to do with it. The power to perform miracles is necessarily implied in the power to create. But would God want to perform a miracle, this is the question which has given most of the trouble. The more I have considered it the less inclined I am to answer in the negative. To say that God would not. Perform a miracle is to assume a more intimate knowledge of God's plans and purposes than I can claim to have. I will not deny that God does perform a miracle or may perform one merely because I do not know how or why He does it. I find it so difficult to decide each day what God wants done now that I am not presumptuous enough to attempt to declare what God might have wanted to do thousands of years ago. The fact that we are constantly learning of the existence of new forces suggests the possibility that God may operate through forces yet unknown to us, and the mysteries with which we deal every day warn me that faith is as necessary as sight. Who would have credited a century ago the stories that are now told of the wonder working electricity? For ages man had known the lightning, but only to fear it, now, this invisible current is generated by a man-made machine, imprisoned in a man-made wire and made to do the bidding of man. We are even able to dispense with the wire and hurl words through space, and the X-ray has enabled us to look through substances which were supposed, until recently, to exclude all light. The miracle is not more mysterious than many of the things with which man now deals, it is simply different. The miraculous birth of Christ is not more mysterious than any other conception, it is simply unlike it, nor is the resurrection of Christ more mysterious than the myriad resurrections which mark each annual seed time. It is sometimes said that God could not suspend one of his laws without stopping the universe, but do we not suspend or overcome the law of gravitation every day? Every time we move a foot or lift a weight we temporarily overcome one of the most universal of natural laws and yet the world is not disturbed. Science has taught us so many things that we are tempted to conclude that we know everything, but there is really a great unknown which is still unexplored and that which we have learned ought to increase our reverence rather than our egotism. Science has disclosed some of the machinery of the universe, but science has not yet revealed to us the great secret, the secret of life. 
It is to be found in every blade of grass, in every insect, in every bird and in every animal, as well as in man. Six thousand years of recorded history and yet we know no more about the secret of life than they knew in the beginning. We live, we plan, we have our hopes, our fears, and yet in a moment a change may come over any one of us and this body will become a mass of lifeless clay. What is it that, having, we live, and having not, we are as the clod? The progress of the race and the civilization which we now behold are the work of men and women who have not yet solved the mystery of their own lives. And our food, must we understand it before we eat it? If we refuse to eat anything until we could understand the mystery of its growth, we would die of starvation. But mystery does not bother us in the dining room, it is only in the church that it is a stumbling block. I was eating a piece of watermelon some months ago and was struck with its beauty. I took some of the seeds and dried them and weighed them, and found that it would require some 5,000 seeds to weigh a pound, and then I applied mathematics to that 40-pound melon. One of these seeds, put into the ground, when warmed by the sun and moistened by the rain, takes off its coat and goes to work, it gathers from somewhere 200,000 times its own weight, and forcing this raw material through a tiny stem, constructs a watermelon. It ornaments the outside with a covering of green, inside the green it puts a layer of white, and within the white a core of red, and all through the red it scatters seeds, each one capable of continuing the work of reproduction. Where does that little seed get its tremendous power? Where does it find its coloring matter? How does it collect its flavoring extract? How does it build a watermelon? Until you can explain a watermelon, do not be too sure that you can set limits to the power of the Almighty and say just what He would do or how He would do it. I cannot explain the watermelon, but I eat it and enjoy it. The egg is the most universal of foods and its use dates from the beginning, but what is more mysterious than an egg? When an egg is fresh it is an important article of merchandise, a hen can destroy its market value in a week's time, but in two weeks more she can bring forth from it what man could not find in it. We eat eggs, but we cannot explain an egg. Water has been used from the birth of man, we learned after it had been used for ages that it is merely a mixture of gases, but it is far more important that we have water to drink than that we know that it is not water. Everything that grows tells a like story of infinite power. Why should I deny that a divine hand fed a multitude with a few loaves and fishes when I see hundreds of millions fed every year by a hand which converts the seed scattered over the field into an abundant harvest? We know that food can be multiplied in a few months' time, shall we deny the power of the Creator to eliminate the element of time, when we have gone so far in eliminating the element of space? Who am I that I should attempt to measure the arm of the Almighty with my puny arm, or to measure the brain of the infinite with my finite mind? Who am I that I should attempt to put meats and bounds to the power of the Creator? But there is something even more wonderful still, the mysterious change that takes place in the human heart when the man begins to hate the things he loved and to love the things he hated, the marvelous transformation that takes place in the man who, before the change, would have sacrificed a world for his own advancement but who, after the change, would give his life for a principle and esteem it a privilege to make sacrifice for his convictions. What greater miracle than this, that converts a selfish, self-centered human being into a center from which good influences flow out in every direction. And yet this miracle has been wrought in the heart of each one of us, or may be wrought, and we have seen it wrought in the hearts and lives of those about us. No, living a life that is a mystery, and living in the midst of mystery and miracles, I shall not allow either to deprive me of the benefits of the Christian religion. If you ask me if I understand everything in the Bible, I answer, no, but if we will try to live up to what we do understand, we will be kept so busy doing good that we will not have time to worry about the passages which we do not understand. Some of those who question the miracle also question the theory of atonement, they assert that it does not accord with their idea of justice for one to die for all. Let each one bear his own sins and the punishments due for them, they say. The doctrine of vicarious suffering is not a new one, it is as old as the race. 
That one should suffer for others is one of the most familiar of principles and we see the principle illustrated every day of our lives. Take the family, for instance, from the day the mother's first child is born, for twenty or thirty years her children are scarcely out of her waking thoughts. Her life trembles in the balance at each child's birth, she sacrifices for them, she surrenders herself to them. Is it because she expects them to pay her back? Fortunate for the parent and fortunate for the child if the latter has an opportunity to repay in part the debt it owes. But no child can compensate a parent for a parent's care. In the course of nature the debt is paid, not to the parent, but to the next generation, and the next, each generation suffering, sacrificing for and surrendering itself to the generation that follows. This is the law of our lives. Nor is this confined to the family. Every step in civilization has been made possible by those who have been willing to sacrifice for posterity. Freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of conscience and free government have all been won for the world by those who were willing to labor unselfishly for their fellows. So well established is this doctrine that we do not regard anyone as great unless he recognizes how unimportant his life is in comparison with the problems with which he deals. I find proof that man was made in the image of his creator in the fact that, throughout the centuries, man has been willing to die, if necessary, that blessings denied to him might be enjoyed by his children, his children's children in the world. The seeming paradox, he that saveth his life shall lose it and he that lasseth his life for my sake shall find it, has an application wider than that usually given to it, it is an epitome of history. Those who live only for themselves live little lives, but those who stand ready to give themselves for the advancement of things greater than themselves find a larger life than the one they would have surrendered. Wendell Phillips gave expression to the same idea when he said, What imprudent men the benefactors of the race have been! How prudently most men sink into nameless graves, while now and then a few forget themselves into immortality. We win immortality, not by remembering ourselves, but by forgetting ourselves in devotion to things larger than ourselves. Instead of being an unnatural plan, the plan of salvation is in perfect harmony with human nature as we understand it. Sacrifice is the language of love, and Christ, in suffering for the world, adopted the only means of reaching the heart. This can be demonstrated not only by theory but by experience, for the story of his life, his teachings, his sufferings and his death has been translated into every language and everywhere it has touched the heart. But if I were going to present an argument in favor of the divinity of Christ, I would not begin with miracles or mystery or with the theory of atonement. I would begin as Carnegie Simpson does in his book entitled, The Fact of Christ. Commencing with the undisputed fact that Christ lived, he points out that one cannot contemplate this fact without feeling that in some way it is related to those now living. He says that one can read of Alexander, of Caesar, or of Napoleon, and not feel that it is a matter of personal concern, but that when one reads that Christ lived, and how he lived and how he died, he feels that somehow there is a cord that stretches from that life to his. As he studies the character of Christ he becomes conscious of certain virtues which stand out in bold relief, his purity, his forgiving spirit, and his unfathomable love. The author is correct, Christ presents an example of purity in thought and life, and man, conscious of his own imperfections and grieved over his shortcomings, finds inspiration in the fact that he was tempted in all points like as we are, and yet without sin. I am not sure but that each can find just here a way of determining for himself whether he possesses the true spirit of a Christian. If the sinlessness of Christ inspires within him an earnest desire to conform his life more nearly to the perfect example, he is indeed a follower, if, on the other hand, he resents the reproof which the purity of Christ offers, and refuses to mend his ways, he has yet to be born again. The most difficult of all the virtues to cultivate is the forgiving spirit. Revenge seems to be natural with man, it is human to want to get even with an enemy. It has even been popular to boast of vindictiveness, it was once inscribed on a man's monument that he had repaid both friends and enemies more than he had received. This was not the spirit of Christ. 
He taught forgiveness and in that incomparable prayer which he left as model for our petitions, he made our willingness to forgive the measure by which we may claim forgiveness. He not only taught forgiveness but he exemplified his teachings in his life. When those who persecuted him brought him to the most disgraceful of all deaths, his spirit of forgiveness rose above his sufferings and he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But love is the foundation of Christ's creed. The world had known love before, parents had loved their children, and children their parents, husbands had loved their wives, and wives their husbands, and friend had loved friend, but Jesus gave a new definition of love. His love was as wide as the sea, its limits were so far flung that even an enemy could not travel beyond its bounds. Other teachers sought to regulate the lives of their followers by rule and formula, but Christ's plan was to purify the heart and then to leave love to direct the footsteps. What conclusion is to be drawn from the life, the teachings and the death of this historic figure? Reared in a carpenter shop, with no knowledge of literature, save Bible literature, with no acquaintance with philosophers living or with the writings of sages dead, when only about thirty years old he gathered disciples about him, promulgated a higher code of morals than the world had ever known before, and proclaimed himself the Messiah. He taught and performed miracles for a few brief months and then was crucified, his disciples were scattered and many of them put to death, his claims were disputed, his resurrection denied and his followers persecuted. And yet from this beginning his religion spread until hundreds of millions have taken his name with reverence upon their lips and millions have been willing to die rather than surrender the faith which he put into their hearts. How shall we account for him? Here is the greatest fact of history, here is one who has with increasing power, for 1900 years, molded the hearts, the thoughts and the lives of men, and he exerts more influence to day than ever before. What think ye of Christ? It is easier to believe him divine than to explain in any other way what he said and did and was. And I have greater faith, even than before, since I have visited the Orient and witnessed the successful contest which Christianity is waging against the religions and philosophies of the East. I was thinking a few years ago of the Christmas which was then approaching and of him in whose honor the day is celebrated. I recalled the message, Peace on Earth, Goodwill to Men, and then my thoughts ran back to the prophecy uttered centuries before his birth, in which he was described as the Prince of Peace. To reinforce my memory I re-read the prophecy and I found immediately following a verse which I had forgotten, a verse which declares that of the increase of his peace and government there shall be no end, and, Isaiah adds, that he shall judge his people with justice and with judgment. I had been reading of the rise and fall of nations, and occasionally I had met a gloomy philosopher who preached the doctrine that nations, like individuals, must of necessity have their birth, their infancy, their maturity and finally their decay and death. But here I read of a government that is to be perpetual, a government of increasing peace and blessedness, the government of the Prince of Peace, and it is to rest on justice. I have thought of this prophecy many times during the last few years, and I have selected this theme that I might present some of the reasons which lead me to believe that Christ has fully earned the right to be called the Prince of Peace, a title that will in the years to come be more and more applied to him. If he can bring peace to each individual heart, and if his creed when applied will bring peace throughout the earth, who will deny his right to be called the Prince of Peace? All the world is in search of peace, every heart that ever beat has sought for peace, and many have been the methods employed to secure it. Some have thought to purchase it with riches and have labored to secure wealth, hoping to find peace when they were able to go where they pleased and buy what they liked. Of those who have endeavored to purchase peace with money, the large majority have failed to secure the money. But what has been the experience of those who have been eminently successful in finance? They all tell the same story, viz., that they spent the first half of their lives trying to get money from others and the last half trying to keep others from getting their money, and that they found peace in neither half. Some have even reached the point where they find difficulty in getting people to accept their money, and I know of no better indication of the ethical awakening in this country than the increasing tendency to scrutinize the methods of money making. I am sanguine enough to believe that the time will yet come when respectability will no longer be sold to great criminals by helping them to spend their ill-gotten gains. 
A long step in advance will have been taken when religious, educational and charitable institutions refuse to condone conscienceless methods in business and leave the possessor of illegitimate accumulations to learn how lonely life is when one prefers money to morals. Some have sought peace in social distinction, but whether they have been within the charmed circle and fearful lest they might fall out, or outside, and hopeful that they might get in, they have not found peace. Some have thought, vain thought, to find peace in political prominence, but whether office comes by birth, as in monarchies, or by election, as in republics, it does not bring peace. An office is not considered a high one if all can occupy it. Only when few in a generation can hope to enjoy an honor do we call it a great honor. I am glad that our Heavenly Father did not make the peace of the human heart to depend upon our ability to buy it with money, secure it in society, or win it at the polls, for in either case but few could have obtained it, but when he made peace the reward of a conscience void of offense toward God and man, he put it within the reach of all. The poor can secure it as easily as the rich, the social outcasts as freely as the leader of society, and the humblest citizen equally with those who wield political power. To those who have grown gray in the church, I need not speak of the peace to be found in faith in God and trust in an overruling providence. Christ taught that our lives are precious in the sight of God, and poets have taken up the thought and woven it into immortal verse. No uninspired writer has expressed it more beautifully than William Cullen Bryant in his Ode to a Waterfowl. After following the wanderings of the bird of passage as it seeks first its southern and then its northern home, he concludes. Thou art gone. The abyss of heaven hath swallowed up thy form, but on my heart deeply hath sunk the lesson thou hast given, and shall not soon depart. He who, from zone to zone, guides through the boundless sky thy certain flight, in the long way that I must tread alone, will lead my steps aright. Christ promoted peace by giving us assurance that a line of communication can be established between the Father above and the child below. And who will measure the consolations of the hour of prayer? And immortality. Who will estimate the peace which a belief in a future life has brought to the sorrowing hearts of the sons of men? You may talk to the young about death ending all, for life is full and hope is strong, but preach not this doctrine to the mother who stands by the death bed of her babe or to one who is within the shadow of a great affliction. When I was a young man I wrote to Colonel Ingersoll and asked him for his views on God and immortality. His secretary answered that the great infidel was not at home, but enclosed a copy of a speech of Colonel Ingersoll's which covered my question. I scanned it with eagerness and found that he had expressed himself about as follows, I do not say that there is no God, I simply say I do not know. I do not say that there is no life beyond the grave, I simply say I do not know. And from that day to this I have asked myself the question and have been unable to answer it to my own satisfaction, how could anyone find pleasure in taking from a human heart a living faith and substituting therefore the cold and cheerless doctrine, I do not know. Christ gave us proof of immortality and it was a welcome assurance, although it would hardly seem necessary that one should rise from the dead to convince us that the grave is not the end. To every created thing God has given a tongue that proclaims a future life. If the Father deigns to touch with divine power the cold and pulseless heart of the buried acorn and to make it burst forth from its prison walls, will he leave neglected in the earth the soul of man, made in the image of his Creator? If he stoops to give to the rose bush, whose withered blossoms float upon the autumn breeze, the sweet assurance of another springtime, will he refuse the words of hope to the sons of men when the frosts of winter come? If matter, mute and inanimate, though changed by the forces of nature into a multitude of forms, can never die, will the imperial spirit of man suffer annihilation when it has paid a brief visit like a royal guest to this tenement of clay? No, I am sure that he who, notwithstanding his apparent prodigality, created nothing without a purpose, and wasted not a single atom in all his creation, has made provision for a future life in which man's universal longing for immortality will find its realization. I am as sure that we live again as I am sure that we live today. In Cairo I secured a few grains of wheat that had slumbered for more than thirty centuries in an Egyptian tomb. 
As I looked at them this thought came into my mind, if one of those grains had been planted on the banks of the Nile the year after it grew, and all its lineal descendants had been planted and replanted from that time until now, its progeny would to day be sufficiently numerous to feed the teeming millions of the world. An unbroken chain of life connects the earliest grains of wheat with the grains that we sow and reap. There is in the grain of wheat an invisible something which has power to discard the body that we see, and from earth and air fashion a new body so much like the old one that we cannot tell the one from the other. If this invisible germ of life in the grain of wheat can thus pass unimpaired through three thousand resurrections, I shall not doubt that my soul has power to clothe itself with a body suited to its new existence when this earthly frame has crumbled into dust. A belief in immortality not only consoles the individual, but it exerts a powerful influence in bringing peace between individuals. If one actually thinks that man dies as the brute dies, he will yield more easily to the temptation to do injustice to his neighbor when the circumstances are such as to promise security from detection. But if one really expects to meet again, and live eternally with, those whom he knows to, day, he is restrained from evil deeds by the fear of endless remorse. We do not know what rewards are in store for us or what punishments may be reserved, but if there were no other it would be some punishment for one who deliberately and consciously wrongs another to have to live forever in the company of the person wronged and have his littleness and selfishness laid bare. I repeat, a belief in immortality must exert a powerful influence in establishing justice between men and thus laying the foundation for peace. Again, Christ deserves to be called the Prince of Peace because He has given us a measure of greatness which promotes peace. When his disciples quarreled among themselves as to which should be greatest in the kingdom of heaven, he rebuked them and said, Let him who would be chiefest among you be the servant of all. Service is the measure of greatness, it always has been true, it is true to day, and it always will be true, that he is greatest who does the most of good. And how this old world will be transformed when this standard of greatness becomes the standard of every life. Nearly all of our controversies and combats grow out of the fact that we are trying to get something from each other, there will be peace when our aim is to do something for each other. Our enmities and animosities arise largely from our efforts to get as much as possible out of the world, there will be peace when our endeavor is to put as much as possible into the world. The human measure of a human life is its income, the divine measure of a life is its outgo, its overflow its contribution to the welfare of all. Christ also led the way to peace by giving us a formula for the propagation of truth. Not all of those who have really desired to do good have employed the Christian method, not all Christians even. In the history of the human race but two methods have been used. The first is the forcible method, and it has been employed most frequently. A man has an idea which he thinks is good, he tells his neighbors about it and they do not like it. This makes him angry, he thinks it would be so much better for them if they would like it, and, seizing a club, he attempts to make them like it. But one trouble about this rule is that it works both ways, when a man starts out to compel his neighbors to think as he does, he generally finds them willing to accept the challenge and they spend so much time in trying to coerce each other that they have no time left to do each other good. The other is the Bible plan, be not overcome of evil but overcome evil with good. And there is no other way of overcoming evil. I am not much of a farmer, I get more credit for my farming than I deserve, and my little farm receives more advertising than it is entitled to. But I am farmer enough to know that if I cut down weeds they will spring up again, and farmer enough to know that if I plant something there which has more vitality than the weeds I shall not only get rid of the constant cutting, but have the benefit of the crop besides. In order that there might be no mistake in his plan of propagating the truth, Christ went into detail and laid emphasis upon the value of example, so live that others seeing your good works may be constrained to glorify your Father which is in heaven. There is no human influence so potent for good as that which goes out from an upright life. A sermon may be answered, the arguments presented in a speech may be disputed, but no one can answer a Christian life, it is the unanswerable argument in favor of our religion. It may be a slow process, this conversion of the world by the silent influence of a noble example, 
but it is the only sure one, and the doctrine applies to nations as well as to individuals. The gospel of the Prince of Peace gives us the only hope that the world has, and it is an increasing hope, of the substitution of reason for the arbitrament of force in the settlement of international disputes. And our nation ought not to wait for other nations, it ought to take the lead and prove its faith in the omnipotence of truth. But Christ has given us a platform so fundamental that it can be applied successfully to all controversies. We are interested in platforms, we attend conventions, sometimes traveling long distances, we have wordy wars over the phraseology of various planks, and then we wage earnest campaigns to secure the endorsement of these platforms at the polls. The platform given to the world by the Prince of Peace is more far-reaching and more comprehensive than any platform ever written by the convention of any party in any country. When he condensed into one commandment those of the ten which relate to man's duty toward his fellows and enjoined upon us the rule, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, he presented a plan for the solution of all the problems that now vex society or may hereafter arise. Other remedies may palliate or postpone the day of settlement, but this is all, sufficient and the reconciliation which it affects is a permanent one. My faith in the future, and I have faith, and my optimism, for I am an optimist, my faith and my optimism rest upon the belief that Christ's teachings are being more studied today than ever before, and that with this larger study will come a larger application of those teachings to the everyday life of the world, and to the questions with which we deal. In former times when men read that Christ came to bring life and immortality to light, they placed the emphasis upon immortality, now they are studying Christ's relation to human life. People used to read the Bible to find out what it said of heaven, now they read it more to find what light it throws upon the pathway of today. In former years many thought to prepare themselves for future bliss by a life of seclusion here, we are learning that to follow in the footsteps of the Master we must go about doing good. Christ declared that He came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. The world is learning that Christ came not to narrow life, but to enlarge it, not to rob it of its joy, but to fill it to overflowing with purpose, earnestness and happiness. But this Prince of Peace promises not only peace but strength. Some have thought his teachings fit only for the weak and the timid and unsuited to men of vigor, energy and ambition. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Only the man of faith can be courageous. Confident that he fights on the side of Jehovah, he doubts not the success of his cause. What matters it whether he shares in the shouts of triumph? If every word spoken in behalf of truth has its influence and every deed done for the right ways in the final account, it is immaterial to the Christian whether his eyes behold victory or whether he dies in the midst of the conflict. Yeah, though thou lie upon the dust, when they who help thee flee in fear, die full of hope and manly trust, like those who fell in battle here. Another hand thy sword shall wield, another hand the standard wave, till from the trumpet's mouth is pealed, the blast of triumph o'er thy grave. Only those who believe. Attempt the seemingly impossible, and, by attempting, prove that one, with God, can chase a thousand and that too can put ten thousand to flight. I can imagine that the early Christians who were carried into the Colosseum to make a spectacle for those more savage than the beasts, were entreated by their doubting companions not to endanger their lives. But, kneeling in the center of the arena, they prayed and sang until they were devoured. How helpless they seemed, and, measured by every human rule, how hopeless was their cause. And yet within a few decades the power which they invoked proved mightier than the legions of the emperor and the faith in which they died was triumphant o'er all the land. It is said that those who went to mock at their sufferings returned asking themselves, what is it that can enter into the heart of man and make him die as these die? They were greater conquerors in their death than they could have been had they purchased life by a surrender of their faith. What would have been the fate of the church if the early Christians had had as little faith as many of our Christians of today? And if the Christians of today had the faith of the martyrs, how long would it be before the fulfillment of the prophecy that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess? I am glad that he, who is called the Prince of Peace, 
who can bring peace to every troubled heart and whose teachings, exemplified in life, will bring peace between man and man, between community and community, between state and state, between nation and nation throughout the world, I am glad that he brings courage as well as peace so that those who follow him may take up and each day bravely do the duties that to that day fall. As the Christian grows older he appreciates more and more the completeness with which Christ satisfies the longings of the heart, and, grateful for the peace which he enjoys and for the strength which he has received, he repeats the words of the great scholar, Sir William Jones. Before thy mystic altar, heavenly truth, I kneel in manhood, as I knelt in youth, thus let me kneel, till this dull form decay, and life's last shade be brightened by thy ray. Rufus Choate Eulogy of Webster Delivered at Dartmouth College, July 27, 1853 Webster possessed the element of an impressive character, inspiring regard, trust and admiration, not unmingled with love. It had, I think, intrinsically a charm such as belongs only to a good, noble, and beautiful nature. In its combination with so much fame, so much force of will, and so much intellect, it filled and fascinated the imagination and heart. It was affectionate in childhood and youth, and it was more than ever so in the few last months of his long life. It is the universal testimony that he gave to his parents, in largest measure, honor, love, obedience, that he eagerly appropriated the first means which he could command to relieve the father from the debts contracted to educate his brother and himself, that he selected his first place of professional practice that he might suit the coming on of his old age. Equally beautiful was his love of all his kindred and of all his friends. When I hear him accused of selfishness, and a cold, bad nature, I recall him lying sleepless all night, not without tears of boyhood, conferring with Ezekiel how the darling desire of both hearts should be compassed, and he, too, admitted to the precious privileges of education, courageously pleading the cause of both brothers in the morning, prevailing by the wise and discerning affection of the mother, suspending his studies of the law, and registering deeds and teaching school to earn the means, for both, of availing themselves of the opportunity which the parental self-sacrifice had placed within their reach, loving him through life, mourning him when dead, with a love and a sorrow very wonderful, passing the sorrow of woman, I recall the husband, the father of the living and of the early departed, the friend, the counselor of many years, and my heart grows too full and liquid for the refutation of words. His affectionate nature, craving ever friendship, as well as the presence of kindred blood, diffused itself through all his private life, gave sincerity to all his hospitalities, kindness to his eye, warmth to the pressure of his hand, made his greatness and genius unbend themselves to the playfulness of childhood, flowed out in graceful memories indulged of the past or the dead, of incidents when life was young and promised to be happy, gave generous sketches of his rivals, the high contention. Now hidden by the handful of earth, hours passed fifty years ago with great authors, recalled for the vernal emotions which then they made to live and revel in the soul. And from these conversations of friendship, no man, no man, old or young, went away to remember one word of profaneness, one illusion of indelicacy, one impure thought, one unbelieving suggestion, one doubt cast on the reality of virtue, of patriotism, of enthusiasm, of the progress of man, one doubt cast on righteousness, or temperance, or judgment to come. I have learned by evidence the most direct and satisfactory that in the last months of his life, the whole affectionateness of his nature, his consideration of others, his gentleness, his desire to make them happy and to see them happy, seemed to come out in more and more beautiful and habitual expressions than ever before. The long day's public tasks were felt to be done, the cares, the uncertainties, the mental conflicts of high place, were ended, and he came home to recover himself for the few years which he might still expect would be his before he should go hence to be here no more. And there, I am assured and duly believe, no unbecoming regrets pursued him, no discontent, as for injustice suffered or expectations unfulfilled, no self-reproach for anything done or anything omitted by himself, no irritation, 
no peevishness unworthy of his noble nature, but instead, love and hope for his country, when she became the subject of conversation, and for all around him, the dearest and most indifferent, for all breathing things about him, the overflow of the kindest heart growing. In gentleness and benevolence, paternal, patriarchal affections, seeming to become more natural, warm, and communicative every hour. Softer and yet brighter grew the tints on the sky of parting day, and the last lingering rays, more even than the glories of noon, announced how divine was the source from which they proceeded, how incapable to be quenched, how certain to rise on a morning which no night should follow. Such a character was made to be loved. It was loved. Those who knew and saw it in its hour of calm, those who could repose on that soft green, loved him. His plain neighbors loved him, and one said, when he was laid in his grave, how lonesome the world seems. Educated young men loved him. The ministers of the gospel, the general intelligence of the country, the masses afar oft, loved him. The great and unavailing lamentations first revealed the deep place he had in the hearts of his countrymen. The great and unavailing lamentations first revealed the deep place he had in the hearts of his countrymen. You are now to add to this his extraordinary power of influencing the convictions of others by speech, and you have completed the survey of the means of his greatness. And here, again I begin by admiring an aggregate made up of excellences and triumphs, ordinarily deemed incompatible. He spoke with consummate ability to the bench, and yet exactly as, according to every sound canon of taste and ethics, the bench ought to be addressed. He spoke with consummate ability to the jury, and yet exactly as, according to every sound canon, that totally different tribunal ought to be addressed. In the halls of Congress, before the people assembled for political discussion in masses, before audiences smaller and more select, assembled for some solemn commemoration of the past or of the dead, in each of these, again, his speech, of the first form of ability, was exactly adapted, also, to the critical properties of the place, each achieved, when delivered, the most instant and specific success of eloquence, some of them in a splendid and remarkable degree, and yet, stranger still, when reduced to writing, as they fell from his lips, they compose a body of reading in many volumes, solid, clear, rich, and full of harmony, a classical and permanent political literature. And yet all these modes of his eloquence, exactly adapted each to its stage and its end, were stamped with his image and superscription, identified by characteristics incapable to be counterfeited and impossible to be mistaken. The same sovereignty of form, of brow, and eye, and tone, and manner, everywhere the intellectual king of men, standing before you, that same marvelousness of qualities and results, residing, I know not where, in words, in pictures, in the ordering of ideas, in felicities indescribable, by means whereof, coming from his tongue, all things seemed mended, truth seemed more true, probability more plausible, greatness more grand, goodness more awful, every affection more tender than when coming from. Other tongues, these are, in all, his eloquence. The same sovereignty of form, of brow, and eye, and tone, and manner, everywhere the intellectual king of men, standing before you, that same marvelousness of qualities and results, residing, I know not where, in words, in pictures, in the ordering of ideas, in felicities indescribable, by means whereof, coming from his tongue, all things seemed mended, truth seemed more true, probability more plausible, greatness more grand. Goodness more awful, every affection more tender than when coming from. Other tongues, these are, in all, his eloquence. But sometimes it became individualized and discriminated even from itself, sometimes place and circumstances, great interests at stake, a stage, an audience fitted for the highest historic action, a crisis, personal or national, upon him, stirred the depths of that emotional nature, as the anger of the goddess stirs the sea on which the great epic is beginning, strong passions themselves kindled to intensity, quickened every faculty to a new life, the stimulated associations of ideas brought. All treasures of thought and knowledge within command, the spell, which often held his imagination fast, dissolved, 
and she arose and gave him to choose of her urn of gold, earnestness became vehemence, the simple, perspicuous, measured and direct language became a headlong, full, and burning tide of speech, the discourse of reason, wisdom, gravity, and beauty changed to that superhuman, that rarest consummate eloquence, grand, rapid, pathetic, terrible, the aliquid immensum infinitum. That Cicero might have recognized, the master triumph of man in the rarest opportunity of his noble power. Such elevation above himself, in congressional debate, was most uncommon. Some such there were in the great discussions of executive power following the removal of the deposits, which they who heard them will never forget, and some which rest in the tradition of hearers only. But there were other fields of oratory on which, under the influence of more uncommon springs of inspiration, he exemplified, in still other forms, an eloquence in which I do not know that he has had a superior among men. Addressing masses by tens of thousands in the open air, on the urgent political questions of the day, or designed to lead the meditations of an hour devoted to the remembrance of some national era, or of some incident marking the progress of the nation, and lifting him up to a view of what is, and what is past, and some indistinct revelation of the glory that lies in the future, or of some great historical name, just borne by the nation to his tomb, we have learned that then and there, at the base of Bunker Hill, before the corner, stone was laid, and again when from the finished column the centuries looked on him, in Faneuil Hall, mourning for those with whose spoken or written eloquence of freedom its arches had so often resounded, on the rock of Plymouth. Before the capital, of which there shall not be one stone left on another before his memory shall have ceased to live, in such scenes, unfettered by the laws of forensic or parliamentary debate, multitudes uncounted lifting up their eyes to him, some great historical scenes of America around, all symbols of her glory in art and power and fortune there, voices of the past, not unheard, shapes beckoning from the future, not unseen, sometimes that mighty intellect, borne upward to a height and kindled to an illumination which we shall see no more, wrought out, as it were, in an instant a picture of vision, warning, prediction, the progress of the nation, the contrasts of its eras, the heroic deaths, the motives to patriotism, the maxims and arts imperial by which the glory has been gathered and may be heightened, wrought out, in an instant, a picture to fade only when all record of our mind shall die. In looking over the public remains of his oratory, it is striking to remark how, even in that most sober and massive understanding in nature, you see gathered and expressed the characteristic sentiments and the passing time of our America. It is the strong old oak which ascends before you, yet our soil, our heaven, are attested in it as perfectly as if it were a flower that could grow in no other climate and in no other hour of the year or day. Let me instance in one thing only. It is a peculiarity of some schools of eloquence that they embody and utter, not merely the individual genius and character of the speaker, but a national consciousness, a national era, a mood, a hope, a dread, a despair, in which you listen to the spoken history of the time. There is an eloquence of an expiring nation, such as seems to sadden the glorious speech of Demosthenes, such as breathes grand and gloomy from visions of the prophets of the last days of Israel and Judah, such as gave a spell to the expression of Grattan and of Kossuth, the sweetest, most mournful, most awful of the words which man may utter, or which man may hear, the eloquence of a perishing nation. There is another eloquence, in which the national consciousness of a young or renewed and vast strength, of trust in a dazzling certain and limitless future, an inward glorying in victories yet to be won, sounds out as by voice of clarion, challenging to contest for the highest prize of earth, such as that in which the leader of Israel in its first days holds up to the new nation the land of promise, such as that which in the well, imagine speeches scattered by Livy over the history of the Majestic series of victories speaks the Roman consciousness of growing aggrandizement which should subject the world, such as that through which, at the tribunes of her revolution, in the bulletins of her rising soldiers, France told to the world her dream of glory. And of this kind somewhat is ours, cheerful, hopeful, trusting, as befits youth and spring, the eloquence of a state beginning to ascend to the first class of power, eminence, and consideration, and conscious of itself.
It is to no purpose that they tell you it is in bad taste, that it partakes of arrogance and vanity, that a true national good breeding would not know, or seem to know, whether the nation is old or young, whether the tides of being are in their flow or ebb, whether these coursers of the sun are sinking slowly to rest, wearied with a journey of a thousand years, or just bounding from the Orient unbreathed. Higher laws than those of taste determine the consciousness of nations. Higher laws than those of taste determine the general forms of the expression of that consciousness. Let the downward age of America find its orators and poets and artists to erect its spirit, or grace and soothe its dying, be it ours to go up with Webster to the rock, the monument, the capital, and bid the distant generations hail. Until the seventh day of March, 1850, I think it would have been accorded to him by an almost universal acclaim, as general and as expressive of profound and intelligent conviction and of enthusiasm, love, and trust, as ever saluted conspicuous statesmanship, tried by many crises of affairs in a great nation, agitated ever by parties, and wholly free. Albert J. Beveridge Has Prosperity Around Delivered as Temporary Chairman of Progressive National Convention, Chicago, Illinois, June, 1911. We stand for a nobler America. We stand for an undivided nation. We stand for a broader liberty, a fuller justice. We stand for a social brotherhood as against savage individualism. We stand for an intelligent cooperation instead of a reckless competition. We stand for mutual helpfulness instead of mutual hatred. We stand for equal rights as a fact of life instead of a catch word of politics. We stand for the rule of the people as a practical truth instead of a meaningless pretense. We stand for a representative government that represents the people. We battle for the actual rights of man. To carry out our principles we have a plain program of constructive reform. We mean to tear down only that which is wrong and out of date and where we tear down we mean to build what is right and fitted to the times. We hearken to the call of the present. We mean to make laws fit conditions as they are and meet the needs of the people who are on earth to day. That we may do this we found a party through which all who believe with us can work with us, or, rather, we declare our allegiance to the party which the people themselves have founded. For this party comes from the grassroots. It has grown from the soil of the people's hard necessities. It has the vitality of the people's strong convictions. The people have work to be done and our party is here to do that work. Abuse will only strengthen it, ridicule only hasten its growth, falsehood only speed its victory. For years this party has been forming. Parties exist for the people, not the people for parties. Yet for years the politicians have made the people do the work of the parties instead of the parties doing the work of the people, and the politicians own the parties. The people vote for one party and find their hopes turned to ashes on their lips, and then to punish that party, they vote for the other party. So it is that partisan victories have come to be merely the people's vengeance, and always the secret powers have played their game. Like other free people, most of us Americans are progressive or reactionary, liberal or conservative. The neutrals do not count. Yet to day neither of the old parties is either wholly progressive or wholly reactionary. Democratic politicians and office seekers say to reactionary Democratic voters that the Democratic Party is reactionary enough to express reactionary views, and they say to progressive Democrats that the Democratic Party is progressive enough to express progressive views. At the same time, Republican politicians and office seekers say the same thing about the Republican Party to progressive and reactionary Republican voters. Sometimes in both Democratic and Republican states the progressives get control of the party locally and then the reactionaries recapture the same party in the same state, or this process is reversed. So there is no nation-wide unity of principle in either party, no stability of purpose, no clear, cut and sincere program of one party at frank and open war with an equally clear, cut and sincere program of an opposing party. This unintelligent tangle is seen in Congress. Republican and Democratic senators and representatives, believing alike on broad measures affecting the whole republic, 
find it hard to vote together because of the nominal difference of their party membership. When, sometimes, under resistless conviction, they do vote together, we have this foolish spectacle, legislators calling themselves Republicans and Democrats support the same policy, the Democratic legislators declaring that that policy is Democratic and Republican legislators declaring that it is Republican. And at the very same time other Democratic and Republican legislators oppose that very same policy, each of them declaring that it is not Democratic or not Republican. The condition makes it impossible most of the time, and hard at any time, for the people's legislators who believe in the same broad policies to enact them into logical, comprehensive laws. It confuses the public mind. It breeds suspicion and distrust. It enables such special interests as seek unjust gain at the public expense to get what they want. It creates and fosters the degrading boss system in American politics through which these special interests work. This boss system is unknown and impossible under any other free government in the world. In its very nature it is hostile to general welfare. Yet it has grown until it now is a controlling influence in American public affairs. At the present moment notorious bosses are in the saddle of both old parties in various important states which must be carried to elect a president. This black horse cavalry is the most important force in the practical work of the Democratic and Republican parties in the present campaign. Neither of the old party's nominees for president can escape obligation to these old party bosses or shake their practical hold on many and powerful members of the national legislature. Under this boss system, no matter which party wins, the people seldom win, but the bosses almost always win. And they never work for the people. They do not even work for the party to which they belong. They work only for those anti-public interests whose political employees they are. It is these interests that are the real victors in the end. These special interests which suck the people's substance are bipartisan. They use both parties. They are the invisible government behind our visible government. Democratic and Republican bosses alike are brother officers of this hidden power. No matter how fiercely they pretend to fight one another before election, they work together after election. And, acting so, this political conspiracy is able to delay, mutilate or defeat sound and needed laws for the people's welfare and the prosperity of honest business and even to enact bad laws, hurtful to the people's welfare and oppressive to honest business. It is this invisible government which is the real danger to American institutions. Its crude work at Chicago in June, which the people were able to see, was no more wicked than its skillful work everywhere and always which the people are not able to see. But an even more serious condition results from the unnatural alignment of the old parties. Today we Americans are politically shattered by sectionalism. Through the two old parties the tragedy of our history is continued and one great geographical part of the republic is separated from other parts of the republic by an illogical partisan solidarity. The South has men and women as genuinely progressive and others as genuinely reactionary as those in other parts of our country. Yet, for well-known reasons, these sincere and honest Southern progressives and reactionaries vote together in a single party, which is neither progressive nor reactionary. They vote a dead tradition and a local fear, not a living conviction and a national faith. They vote not for the Democratic Party, but against the Republican Party. They want to be free from this condition, they can be free from it through the National Progressive Party. For the problems which America faces today are economic and national. They have to do with a more just distribution of prosperity. They concern the living of the people and therefore the more direct government of the people by themselves. They affect the South exactly as they affect the North, the East or the West. It is an artificial and dangerous condition that prevents the Southern man and woman from acting with the Northern man and woman who believe the same thing. Yet just that is what the old parties do prevent. Not only does this out-of-date partisanship cut our nation into two geographical sections, it also robs the nation of a priceless asset of thought in working out our national destiny. The South once was famous for brilliant and constructive thinking on national problems, 
and to day the South has minds as brilliant and constructive as of old. But Southern intellect cannot freely and fully aid, in terms of politics, the solving of the nation's problems. This is so because of a partisan sectionalism which has nothing to do with those problems. Yet these problems can be solved only in terms of politics. The root of the wrongs which hurt the people is the fact that the people's government has been taken away from them, the invisible government has usurped the people's government. Their government must be given back to the people. And so the first purpose of the progressive party is to make sure the rule of the people. The rule of the people means that the people themselves shall nominate, as well as elect, all candidates for office, including senators and presidents of the United States. What profiteth at the people if they do only the electing while the invisible government does the nominating? The rule of the people means that when the people's legislators make a law which hurts the people, the people themselves may reject it. The rule of the people means that when the people's legislators refuse to pass a law which the people need, the people themselves may pass it. The rule of the people means that when the people's employees do not do the people's work well and honestly, the people may discharge them exactly as a businessman discharges employees who do not do their work well and honestly. The people's officials are the people's servants, not the people's masters. We progressives believe in this rule of the people that the people themselves may deal with their own destiny. Who knows the people's need so well as the people themselves? Who so patient as the people? Who so long-suffering, who so just? Who so wise to solve their own problems? Today these problems concern the living of the people. Yet in the present stage of American development these problems should not exist in this country. For, in all the world there is no land so rich as ours. Our fields can feed hundreds of millions. We have more minerals than the whole of Europe. Invention has made easy the turning of this vast natural wealth into supplies for all the needs of man. One worker today can produce more than twenty workers could produce a century ago. The people living in this land of gold are the most daring and resourceful on the globe. Coming from the hardiest stock of every nation of the old world their very history in the new world has made Americans a peculiar people in courage, initiative, love of justice and all the elements of independent character. And, compared with other peoples, we are very few in numbers. There are only 90 millions of us, scattered over a continent. Germany has 65 millions packed in a country very much smaller than Texas. The population of Great Britain and Ireland could be set down in California and still have more than enough room for the population of Holland. If this country were as thickly peopled as Belgium there would be more than 1200 million instead of only 90 million persons within our borders. So we have more than enough to supply every human being beneath the flag. There ought not to be in this republic a single day of bad business, a single unemployed working man, a single unfed child. American businessmen should never know an hour of uncertainty, discouragement or fear, American workingmen never a day of low wages, idleness or want. Hunger should never walk in these thinly peopled gardens of plenty. And yet in spite of all these favors which Providence has showered upon us, the living of the people is the problem of the hour. Hundreds of thousands of hard-working Americans find it difficult to get enough to live on. The average income of an American laborer is less than $500 a year. With this he must furnish food, shelter, and clothing for a family. Women, whose nourishing and protection should be the first care of the state, not only are driven into the mighty army of wage earners, but are forced to work under unfair and degrading conditions. The right of a child to grow into a normal human being is sacred, and yet, while small and poor countries, packed with people, have abolished child labor, American mills, mines, factories and sweat shops are destroying hundreds of thousands of American children in body, mind and soul. At the same time men have grasped fortunes in this country so great that the human mind cannot comprehend their magnitude. These mountains of wealth are far larger than even that lavish reward which no one would deny to business risk or genius. 
On the other hand, American business is uncertain and unsteady compared with the business of other nations. American businessmen are the best and bravest in the world, and yet our business conditions hamper their energies and chill their courage. We have no permanency in business affairs, no sure outlook upon the business future. This unsettled state of American business prevents it from realizing for the people that great and continuous prosperity which our country's location, vast wealth and small population justifies. We mean to remedy these conditions. We mean not only to make prosperity steady, but to give to the many who earn it a just share of that prosperity instead of helping the few who do not earn it to take an unjust share. The progressive motto is, pass prosperity around. To make human living easier, to free the hands of honest business, to make trade and commerce sound and steady, to protect womanhood, save childhood and restore the dignity of manhood, these are the tasks we must do. What, then, is the progressive answer to these questions? We are able to give it specifically and concretely. The first work before us is the revival of honest business. For business is nothing but the industrial and trade activities of all the people. Men grow the products of the field, cut ripe timber from the forest, dig metal from the mine, fashion all for human use, carry them to the marketplace and exchange them according to their mutual needs, and this is business. With our vast advantages, contrasted with the vast disadvantages of other nations, American business all the time should be the best and steadiest in the world. But it is not. Germany, with shallow soil, no mines, only a window on the seas and a population more than ten times as dense as ours, yet has a sounder business, a steadier prosperity, a more contented because better cared for people. What, then, must we do to make American business better? We must do what poorer nations have done. We must end the abuses of business by striking down those abuses instead of striking down business itself. We must try to make little business big and all business honest instead of striving to make big business little and yet letting it remain dishonest. Present day business is as unlike old time business as the old time ox cart is unlike the present day locomotive. Invention has made the whole world over again. The railroad, telegraph, telephone have bound the people of modern nations into families. To do the business of these closely knit millions in every modern country great business concerns came into being. What we call big business is the child of the economic progress of mankind. So warfare to destroy big business is foolish because it cannot succeed and wicked because it ought not to succeed. Warfare to destroy big business does not hurt big business, which always comes out on top, so much as it hurts all other business which, in such a warfare, never comes out on top. With the growth of big business came business evils just as great. It is these evils of big business that hurt the people and injure all other business. One of these wrongs is overcapitalization which taxes the people's very living. Another is the manipulation of prices to the unsettlement of all normal business and to the people's damage. Another is interference in the making of the people's laws and the running of the people's government in the unjust interest of evil business. Getting laws that enable particular interests to rob the people, and even to gather criminal riches from human health and life is still another. An example of such laws is the infamous tobacco legislation of 1902, which authorized the Tobacco Trust to continue to collect from the people the Spanish War tax, amounting to a score of millions of dollars, but to keep that tax instead of turning it over to the government, as it had been doing. Another example is the shameful meat legislation, by which the Beef Trust had the meat it sent abroad inspected by the government so that foreign countries would take its product and yet was permitted to sell diseased meat to our own people. It is incredible that laws like these could ever get on the nation's statute books. The invisible government put them there, and only the universal wrath of an enraged people corrected them when, after years, the people discovered the outrages.
It is to get just such laws as these and to prevent the passage of laws to correct them, as well as to keep off the statute books general laws which will end the general abuses of big business that these few criminal interests corrupt our politics, invest in public officials and keep in power in both parties that type of politicians and party managers who debase American politics. Behind rotten laws and preventing sound laws, stands the corrupt boss, behind the corrupt boss stands the robber interest, and commanding these powers of pillage stands bloated human greed. It is this conspiracy of evil we must overthrow if we would get the honest laws we need. It is this invisible government we must destroy if we would save American institutions. Other nations have ended the very same business evils from which we suffer by clearly defining business wrongdoing and then making it a criminal offense, punishable by imprisonment. Yet these foreign nations encourage big business itself and foster all honest business. But they do not tolerate dishonest business, little or big. What, then, shall we Americans do? Common sense and the experience of the world says that we ought to keep the good big business does for us and stop the wrongs that big business does to us. Yet we have done just the other thing. We have struck at big business itself and have not even aimed to strike at the evils of big business. Nearly 25 years ago Congress passed a law to govern American business in the present time which Parliament passed in the reign of King James to govern English business in that time. For a quarter of a century the courts have tried to make this law work. Yet during this very time trusts grew greater in number and power than in the whole history of the world before, and their evils flourished unhindered and unchecked. These great business concerns grew because natural laws made them grow and artificial law at war with natural law could not stop their growth. But their evils grew faster than the trusts themselves because avarice nourished those evils and no law of any kind stopped avarice from nourishing them. Nor is this the worst. Under the shifting interpretation of the Sherman Law, uncertainty and fear is chilling the energies of the great body of honest American businessmen. As the Sherman Law now stands, no two businessmen can arrange their mutual affairs and be sure that they are not law breakers. This is the main hindrance to the immediate and permanent revival of American business. If German or English businessmen, with all their disadvantages compared with our advantages, were manacled by our Sherman Law, as it stands, they soon would be bankrupt. Indeed, foreign businessmen declare that, if their countries had such a law, so administered, they could not do business at all. Even this is not all. By the decrees of our courts, under the Sherman Law, the two mightiest trusts on earth have actually been licensed, in the practical outcome, to go on doing every wrong they ever committed. Under the decrees of the courts the oil and tobacco trusts still can raise prices unjustly and already have done so. They still can issue watered stock and surely will do so. They still can throttle other businessmen and the United Cigar Stores Company now is doing so. They still can corrupt our politics and this moment are indulging in that practice. The people are tired of this mock battle with criminal capital. They do not want to hurt business, but they do want to get something done about the trust question that amounts to something. What good does it do any man to read in his morning paper that the courts have dissolved the oil trust, and then read in his evening paper that he must thereafter pay a higher price for his oil than ever before. What good does it do the laborer who smokes his pipe to be told that the courts have dissolved the tobacco trust and yet find that he must pay the same or a higher price for the same short weight package of tobacco? Yet all this is the practical result of the suits against these two greatest trusts in the world. Such business chaos and legal paradoxes as American business suffers from can be found nowhere else in the world. Rival nations do not fasten legal ball and chain upon their business, no, they put wings on its flying feet. Rival nations do not tell their businessmen that if they go forward with legitimate enterprise the penitentiary may be their goal. No. Rival nations tell their businessmen that so long as they do honest business their governments will not hinder but will help them. But these rival nations do tell their businessmen that if they do any evil that our businessmen do, prison bars await them. These rival nations do tell their businessmen that if they issue watered stock or cheat the people in any way, 
prison cells will be their homes. Just this is what all honest American business wants, just this is what dishonest American business does not want, just this is what the American people propose to have, just this the National Republican Platform of 1908 pledged the people that we would give them, and just this important pledge the administration, elected on that platform, repudiated as it repudiated the more immediate tariff pledge. Both these reforms, so vital to honest American business, the Progressive Party will accomplish. Neither evil interests nor reckless demagogues can swerve us from our purpose, for we are free from both and fear neither. We mean to put new business laws on our statute books which will tell American businessmen what they can do and what they cannot do. We mean to make our business laws clear instead of foggy, to make them plainly state just what things are criminal and what are lawful. And we mean that the penalty for things criminal shall be prison sentences that actually punish the real offender, instead of money fines that hurt nobody but the people, who must pay them in the end. And then we mean to send the message forth to hundreds of thousands of brilliant minds and brave hearts engaged in honest business, that they are not criminals but honorable men in their work to make good business in this republic. Sure of victory, we even now say, go forward, American businessmen, and know that behind you, supporting you, encouraging you, are the power and approval of the greatest people under the sun. Go forward, American businessmen, and feed full the fires beneath American furnaces, and give employment to every American laborer who asks for work. Go forward, American businessmen, and capture the markets of the world for American trade, and know that on the wings of your commerce you carry liberty throughout the world and to every inhabitant thereof. Go forward, American businessmen, and realize that in the time to come it shall be said of you, as it is said of the hand that rounded Peter's dome, he built it better than he knew. The next great business reform we must have to steadily increase American prosperity is to change the method of building our tariffs. The tariff must be taken out of politics and treated as a business question instead of as a political question. Heretofore, we have done just the other thing. That is why American business is upset every few years by unnecessary tariff upheavals and is weakened by uncertainty in the periods between. The greatest need of business is certainty, but the only thing certain about our tariff is uncertainty. What, then, shall we do to make our tariff changes strengthen business instead of weakening business? Rival protective tariff nations have answered that question. Common sense has answered it. Next to our need to make the Sherman Law modern, understandable and just, our greatest fiscal need is a genuine, permanent, non-partisan tariff commission. Five years ago, when the fight for this great business measure was begun in the Senate the bosses of both parties were against it. So, when the last revision of the tariff was on and a tariff commission might have been written into the tariff law, the administration would not aid this reform. When two years later the administration supported it weakly, the bi-partisan boss system killed it. There has not been and will not be any sincere and honest effort by the old parties to get a tariff commission. There has not been and will not be any sincere and honest purpose by those parties to take the tariff out of politics. For the tariff in politics is the excuse for those sham political battles which give the spoilers their opportunity. The tariff in politics is one of the invisible government's methods of wringing tribute from the people. Through the tariff in politics the beneficiaries of tariff excesses are cared for, no matter which party is revising. Who has forgotten the tariff scandals that made President Cleveland denounce the Wilson-Gorman bill as a perfidy and a dishonor? Who ever can forget the brazen robberies forced into the Payne Aldrich bill which Mr. Taft defended as the best ever made? If everyone else forgets these things the interests that profited by them never will forget them. The bosses and lobbyists that grew rich by putting them through never will forget them. That is why the invisible government and its agents want to keep the old method of tariff building. For, though such tariff revisions may make lean years for the people, they make fat years for the powers of pillage and their agents. So neither of the old parties can honestly carry out any tariff policies which they pledge the people to carry out. But even if they could and even if they were sincere, the old party platforms are in error on tariff policy. 
The democratic platform declares for free trade, but free trade is wrong and ruinous. The Republican platform permits extortion, but tariff extortion is robbery by law. The Progressive Party is for honest protection, and honest protection is right and a condition of American prosperity. A tariff high enough to give American producers the American market when they make honest goods and sell them at honest prices but low enough that when they sell dishonest goods at dishonest prices, foreign competition can correct both evils, a tariff high enough to enable American producers to pay our workingmen American wages and so arranged that the workingmen will get such wages. A business tariff whose changes will be so made as to reassure business instead of disturbing it, this is the tariff and the method of its making in which the progressive party believes, for which it does battle and which it proposes to write into the laws of the land. The Payne Aldrich Tariff Law must be revised immediately in accordance to these principles. At the same time a genuine, permanent, non-partisan tariff commission must be fixed in the law as firmly as the Interstate Commerce Commission. Neither of the old parties can do this work. For neither of the old parties believes in such a tariff, and, what is more serious, special privilege is too thoroughly woven into the fiber of both old parties to allow them to make such a tariff. The Progressive Party only is free from these influences. The Progressive Party only believes in the sincere enactment of a sound tariff policy. The Progressive Party only can change the tariff as it must be changed. These are samples of the reforms in the laws of business that we intend to put on the nation's statute books. But there are other questions as important and pressing that we mean to answer by sound and humane laws. Child labor in factories, mills, mines and sweat shops must be ended throughout the republic. Such labor is a crime against childhood because it prevents the growth of normal manhood and womanhood. It is a crime against the nation because it prevents the growth of a host of children into strong, patriotic and intelligent citizens. Only the nation can stop this industrial vice. The states cannot stop it. The states never stopped any national wrong, and child labor is a national wrong. To leave it to the state alone is unjust to business, for if some states stop it and other states do not, businessmen of the former are at a disadvantage with the businessmen of the latter, because they must sell in the same market goods made by manhood labor at manhood wages in competition with goods made by childhood labor at childhood wages. To leave it to the states is unjust to manhood labor, for childhood labor in any state lowers manhood labor in every state, because the product of childhood labor in any state competes with the product of manhood labor in every state. Children workers at the looms in South Carolina means bayonets at the breasts of men and women workers in Massachusetts who strike for living wages. Let the states do what they can, and more power to their arm, but let the nation do what it should and cleanse our flag from this stain. Modern industrialism has changed the status of women. Women now are wage earners in factories, stores and other places of toil. In hours of labor and all the physical conditions of industrial effort they must compete with men. And they must do it at lower wages than men receive, wages which, in most cases, are not enough for these women workers to live on. This is inhuman and indecent. It is unsocial and uneconomic. It is immoral and unpatriotic. Toward women the Progressive Party proclaims the chivalry of the state. We propose to protect women wage earners by suitable laws, an example of which is the minimum wage for women workers, a wage which shall be high enough to at least buy clothing, food and shelter for the woman twaller. The care of the aged is one of the most perplexing problems of modern life. How is the working man with less than $500 a year, and with earning power waning as his own years advance, to provide for aged parents or other relatives in addition to furnishing food, shelter and clothing for his wife and children. What is to become of the family of the laboring man whose strength has been sapped by excessive toil and who has been thrown upon the industrial scrap heap? It is questions like these we must answer if we are to justify free institutions. They are questions to which the masses of people are chained as to a body of death. And they are questions which other and poorer nations are answering. We progressives mean that America shall answer them. 
The Progressive Party is the helping hand to those whom a vicious industrialism has maimed and crippled. We are for the conservation of our natural resources, but even more we are for the conservation of human life. Our forests, water power and minerals are valuable and must be saved from the spoilers, but men, women and children are more valuable and they, too, must be saved from the spoilers. Because women, as much as men, are a part of our economic and social life, women, as much as men, should have the voting power to solve all economic and social problems. Votes for women are theirs as a matter of natural right alone, votes for women should be theirs as a matter of political wisdom also. As wage earners, they should help to solve the labor problem, as property owners they should help to solve the tax problem, as wives and mothers they should help to solve all the problems that concern the home. And that means all national problems, for the nation abides at the fireside. If it is said that women cannot help defend the nation in time of war and therefore that they should not help to determine the nation's destinies in time of peace, the answer is that women suffer and serve in time of conflict as much as men who carry muskets. And the deeper answer is that those who bear the nation's soldiers are as much the nation's defenders as their sons. Public spokesmen for the invisible government say that many of our reforms are unconstitutional. The same kind of men said the same thing of every effort the nation has made to end national abuses. But in every case, whether in the courts, at the ballot box, or on the battlefield, the vitality of the Constitution was vindicated. The Progressive Party believes that the Constitution is a living thing, growing with the people's growth, strengthening with the people's strength, aiding the people in their struggle for life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness, permitting the people to meet all their needs as conditions change. The opposition believes that the constitution is a dead form, holding back the people's growth, shackling the people's strength but giving a free hand to malign powers that prey upon the people. The first words of the constitution are, we the people, and they declare that the constitution's purpose is, to form a perfect union and to promote the general welfare. To do just that is the very heart of the progressive cause. The progressive party asserts anew the vitality of the constitution. We believe in the true doctrine of states' rights, which forbids the nation from interfering with states' affairs, and also forbids the states from interfering with national affairs. The combined intelligence and composite conscience of the American people is as irresistible as it is righteous, and the constitution does not prevent that force from working out the general welfare. From certain sources we hear preachments about the danger of our reforms to American institutions. What is the purpose of American institutions? Why was this republic established? What does the flag stand for? What do these things mean? They mean that the people shall be free to correct human abuses. They mean that men, women and children shall not be denied the opportunity to grow stronger and nobler. They mean that the people shall have the power to make our land each day a better place to live in. They mean the realities of liberty and not the academics of theory. They mean the actual progress of the race in tangible items of daily living and not the theoretics of barren disputation. If they do not mean these things they are as sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. A nation of strong, upright men and women a nation of wholesome homes, realizing the best ideals, a nation whose power is glorified by its justice and whose justice is the conscience of scores of millions of God-fearing people, that is the nation the people need and want. And that is the nation they shall have. For never doubt that we Americans will make good the real meaning of our institutions. Never doubt that we will solve, in righteousness and wisdom, every vexing problem. Never doubt that in the end, the hand from above that leads us upward will prevail over the hand from below that drags us downward. Never doubt that we are indeed a nation whose God is the Lord. And, so, never doubt that a braver, fairer, cleaner America surely will come, that a better and brighter life for all beneath the flag surely will be achieved. Those who now scoff soon will pray. Those who now doubt soon will believe. Soon the night will pass, 
and when, to the sentinel on the ramparts of liberty the anxious ask, Watchman, what of the night, his answer will be, Lo, the morn appeareth. Knowing the price we must pay, the sacrifice we must make, the burdens we must carry, the assaults we must endure, knowing full well the cost, yet we enlist, and we enlist for the war. For we know the justice of our cause, and we know, too, its certain triumph. Not reluctantly then, but eagerly, not with faint hearts but strong, do we now advance upon the enemies of the people. For the call that comes to us is the call that came to our fathers. As they responded so shall we. He hath sounded forth a trumpet that shall never call retreat, he is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift our souls to answer him, be jubilant our feet, our God is marching on. Russell Conwell Acres of Diamonds I am astonished that so many people should care to hear this story over again. Indeed, this lecture has become a study in psychology, it often breaks all rules of oratory, departs from the precepts of rhetoric, and yet remains the most popular of any lecture I have delivered in the forty four years of my public life. I have sometimes studied for a year upon a lecture and made careful research, and then presented the lecture just once, never delivered it again. I put too much work on it. But this had no work on it, thrown together perfectly at random, spoken offhand without any special preparation, and it succeeds when the thing we study, work over, adjust to a plan, is an entire failure. The acres of diamonds which I have mentioned through so many years are to be found in Philadelphia, and you are to find them. Many have found them. And what man has done, man can do. I could not find anything better to illustrate my thought than a story I have told over and over again, and which is now found in books in nearly every library. In 1870 we went down the Tigris River. We hired a guide at Baghdad to show us Persepolis, Nineveh and Babylon, and the ancient countries of Assyria as far as the Arabian Gulf. He was well acquainted with the land, but he was one of those guides who loved to entertain their patrons, he was like a barber that tells you many stories in order to keep your mind off the scratching and the scraping. He told me so many stories that I grew tired of his telling them and I refused to listen, looked away whenever he commenced, that made the guide quite angry. I remember that toward evening he took his Turkish cap off his head and swung it around in the air. The gesture I did not understand and I did not dare look at him for fear I should become the victim of another story. But, although I am not a woman, I did look, and the instant I turned my eyes upon that worthy guide he was off again. Said he, I will tell you a story now which reserve for my particular friends. So then, counting myself a particular friend, I listened, and I have always been glad I did. He said there once lived not far from the river Indus an ancient Persian by the name of Al Haft. He said that Al Haft owned a very large farm with orchards, grain fields and gardens. He was a contented and wealthy man, contented because he was wealthy, and wealthy because he was contented. One day there visited this old farmer one of those ancient Buddhist priests, and he sat down by Al Haft's fire and told that old farmer how this world of ours was made. He said that this world was once a mere bank of fog, which is scientifically true, and he said that the Almighty thrust his finger into the bank of fog and then began slowly to move his finger around and gradually to increase the speed of his finger until at last he whirled that bank of fog into a solid ball of fire, and it went rolling through the universe, burning its way through other cosmic banks of fog, until it condensed the moisture without, and fell in floods of rain upon the heated surface and cooled the outward crust. Then the internal flames burst through the cooling crust and threw up the mountains and made the hills of the valley of this wonderful world of ours. If this internal melted mass burst out and copied very quickly it became granite, that which cooled less quickly became silver, and less quickly, gold, and after gold diamonds were made. Said the old priest, a diamond is a congealed drop of sunlight. This is a scientific truth also. You all know that a diamond is pure carbon, actually deposited sunlight, and he said another thing I would not forget, 
he declared that a diamond is the last and highest of God's mineral creations, as a woman is the last and highest of God's animal creations. I suppose that is the reason why the two have such a liking for each other. And the old priest told Al Haft that if he had a handful of diamonds he could purchase a whole country, and with a mine of diamonds he could place his children upon thrones through the influence of their great wealth. Al Haft heard all about diamonds and how much they were worth, and went to his bed that night a poor man, not that he had lost anything, but poor because he was discontented and discontented because he thought he was poor. He said, I want a mine of diamonds. So he lay awake all night, and early in the morning sought out the priest. Now I know from experience that a priest when awakened early in the morning is cross. He awoke that priest out of his dreams and said to him, Will you tell me where I can find diamonds? The priest said, Diamonds? What do you want with diamonds? I want to be immensely rich, said Al Haft, but I don't know where to go. Well, said the priest, if you will find a river that runs over white sand between high mountains, in those sands you will always see diamonds. Do you really believe that there is such a river? Plenty of them, plenty of them, all you have to do is just go and find them, then you have them. Al Haft said, I will go. So he sold his farm, collected his money at interest, left his family in charge of a neighbor, and away he went in search of diamonds. He began very properly, to my mind, at the mountains of the moon. Afterwards he went around into Palestine, then wandered on into Europe, and at last when his money was all spent, and he was in rags, wretchedness and poverty, he stood on the shore of that bay in Barcelona, Spain, when a tidal wave came rolling through the pillars of Hercules and the poor afflicted, suffering man could not resist the awful temptation to cast himself into that incoming tide, and he sank beneath its foaming crest, never to rise in this life again. When that old guide had told me that very sad story, he stopped the camel I was riding and went back to fix the baggage on one of the other camels, and I remember thinking to myself, why did he reserve that for his particular friends? There seemed to be no beginning, middle or end, nothing to it. That was the first story I ever heard told or read in which the hero was killed in the first chapter. I had but one chapter of that story and the hero was dead. When the guide came back and took up the halter of my camel again, he went right on with the same story. He said that Al Haft's successor led his camel out into the garden to drink, and as that camel put its nose down into the clear water of the garden brook Al Haft's successor noticed a curious flash of light from the sands of the shallow stream, and reaching in he pulled out a black stone having an eye of light that reflected all the colors of the rainbow, and he took that curious pebble into the house and left it on the mantel, then went on his way and forgot all about it. A few days after that, this same old priest who told Al Haft how diamonds were made, came in to visit his successor, when he saw that flash of light from the mantle. He rushed up and said, Here is a diamond, here is a diamond. Has Al Haft returned? No, no, Al Haft has not returned and that is not a diamond, that is nothing but a stone, we found it right out here in our garden. But I know a diamond when I see it, said he, that is a diamond. Then together they rushed to the garden and stirred up the white sands with their fingers and found others more beautiful, more valuable diamonds than the first, and thus, said the guide to me, were discovered the diamond mines of Golconda, the most magnificent diamond mines in all the history of mankind, exceeding the Kimberley in its value. The great Kohener diamond in England's crown jewels and the largest crown diamond on earth in Russia's crown jewels, which I had often hoped she would have to sell before they had peace with Japan, came from that mine, and when the old guide had called my attention to that wonderful discovery he took his Turkish cap off his head again and swung it around in the air to call my attention to the moral. Those Arab guides have a moral to each story, though the stories are not always moral. He said, had Al Haft remained at home and dug in his own cellar or in his own garden, instead of wretchedness, starvation, poverty and death in a strange land, he would have had acres of diamonds, for every acre, yes, every shovelful of that old farm afterwards revealed the gems which since have decorated the crowns of monarchs. When he had given the moral to his story, 
I saw why he had reserved this story for his particular friends. I didn't tell him I could see it, I was not going to tell that old Arab that I could see it. For it was that mean old Arab's way of going around a thing, like a lawyer, and saying indirectly what he did not dare say directly, that there was a certain young man that day traveling down the Tigris River that might better be at home in America. I didn't tell him I could see it. I told him his story reminded me of one, and I told it to him quick. I told him about that man out in California, who, in 1847, owned a ranch out there. He read that gold had been discovered in Southern California, and he sold his ranch to Colonel Sutter and started off to hunt for gold. Colonel Sutter put a mill on the little stream in that farm and one day his little girl brought some wet sand from the raceway of the mill into the house and placed it before the fire to dry, and as that sand was falling through the little girl's fingers a visitor saw the first shining scales of real gold that were ever discovered in California, and the man who wanted the gold had sold this ranch and gone away, never to return. I delivered this lecture two years ago in California, in the city that stands near that farm, and they told me that the mine is not exhausted yet, and that a one-third owner of that farm has been getting during these recent years $20 of gold every 15 minutes of his life, sleeping or waking. Why, you and I would enjoy an income like that. But the best illustration that I have now of this thought was found here in Pennsylvania. There was a man living in Pennsylvania who owned a farm here and he did what I should do if I had a farm in Pennsylvania, he sold it. But before he sold it he concluded to secure employment collecting coal oil for his cousin in Canada. They first discovered coal oil there. So this farmer in Pennsylvania decided that he would apply for a position with his cousin in Canada. Now, you see, this farmer was not altogether a foolish man. He did not leave his farm until he had something else to do. Of all the simpletons the stars shine on there is none more foolish than a man who leaves one job before he has obtained another. And that has a special reference to gentlemen of my profession, and has no reference to a man seeking a divorce. So I say this old farmer did not leave one job until he had obtained another. He wrote to Canada, but his cousin replied that he could not engage him because he did not know anything about the oil business. Well, then, said he, I will understand it. So he set himself at the study of the whole subject. He began at the second day of the creation, he studied the subject from the primitive vegetation to the coal oil stage, until he knew all about it. Then he wrote to his cousin and said, Now I understand the oil business. And his cousin replied to him, All right, then, come on. That man, by the record of the county, sold his farm for $833, even money, no sense. He had scarcely gone from that farm before the man who purchased it went out to arrange for the watering the cattle and he found that the previous owner had arranged the matter very nicely. There is a stream running down the hillside there, and the previous owner had gone out and put a plank across that stream at an angle, extending across the brook and down edgewise a few inches under the surface of the water. The purpose of the plank across that brook was to throw over to the other bank a dreadful looking scum through which the cattle would not put their noses to drink above the plank, although they would drink the water on one side below it. Thus that man who had gone to Canada had been himself damming back for twenty-three years a flow of coal oil which the state geologist of Pennsylvania declared officially, as early as 1870, was then worth to our state a hundred millions of dollars. The city of Titusville now stands on that farm and those Pleasantville wells flow on, and that farmer who had studied all about the formation of oil since the second day of God's creation clear down to the present time, sold that farm for $833, no sense again I say, no sense. But I need another illustration, and I found that in Massachusetts, and I am sorry I did, because that is my old state. This young man I mentioned went out of the state to study, went down to Yale College and studied mines and mining. They paid him $15 a week during his last year for training students who were behind their classes in mineralogy, out of hours, of course, while pursuing his own studies. But when he graduated they raised his pay from $15 to $45 and offered him a professorship. Then he went straight home to his mother and said, Mother, I won't work for $45 a week. 
What is $45 a week for a man with a brain like mine? Mother, let's go out to California and stake out gold claims and be immensely rich. Now, said his mother, it is just as well to be happy as it is to be rich. But as he was the only son he had his way, they always do, and they sold out in Massachusetts and went to Wisconsin, where he went into the employ of the Superior Copper Mining Company, and he was lost from sight in the employ of that company at $15 a week again. He was also to have an interest in any mines that he should discover for that company. But I do not believe that he has ever discovered a mine, I do not know anything about it, but I do not believe he has. I know he had scarcely gone from the old homestead before the farmer who had bought the homestead went out to dig potatoes, and as he was bringing them in in a large basket through the front gateway, the ends of the stone wall came so near together at the gate that the basket hugged very tight. So he set the basket on the ground and pulled, first on one side and then on the other side. Our farms in Massachusetts are mostly stone walls, and the farmers have to be economical with their gateways in order to have some place to put the stones. That basket hugged so tight there that as he was hauling it through he noticed in the upper stone next the gate a block of native silver, 8 inches square, and this professor of mines and mining and mineralogy, who would not work for $45 a week, when he sold that homestead in Massachusetts, sat right on that stone to make the bargain. He was brought up there, he had gone back and forth by that piece of silver, rubbed it with his sleeve, and it seemed to say, come now, 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 here is a hundred thousand dollars. Why not take me? But he would not take it. There was no silver in Newburyport, it was all a way off, well, I don't know where, he didn't, but somewhere else, and he was a professor of mineralogy. I do not know of anything I would enjoy better than to take the whole time to, night telling of blunders like that I have heard professors make. Yet I wish I knew what that man is doing out there in Wisconsin. I can imagine him out there, as he sits by his fireside, and he is saying to his friends, do you know that man Conwell that lives in Philadelphia? Oh, yes, I have heard of him. And do you know that man Jones that lives in that city? Yes, I have heard of him. And then he begins to laugh and laugh and says to his friends, they have done the same thing I did, precisely. And that spoils the whole joke, because you and I have done it. Ninety out of every hundred people here have made that mistake this very day. I say you ought to be rich, you have no right to be poor. To live in Philadelphia and not be rich is a misfortune, and it is doubly a misfortune, because you could have been rich just as well as be poor. Philadelphia furnishes so many opportunities. You ought to be rich. But persons with certain religious prejudice will ask, how can you spend your time advising the rising generation to give their time to getting money, dollars and cents, the commercial spirit? Yet I must say that you ought to spend time getting rich. You and I know there are some things more valuable than money, of course, we do. Ah, uh, yes. By a heart made unspeakably sad by a grave on which the autumn leaves now fall, I know there are some things higher and grander and sublimer than money. Well does the man know, who has suffered, that there are some things sweeter and holier and more sacred than gold. Nevertheless, the man of common sense also knows that there is not any one of those things that is not greatly enhanced by the use of money. Money is power. Love is the grandest thing on God's earth, but fortunate the lover who has plenty of money. Money is power, money has powers, and for a man to say, I do not want money, is to say, I do not wish to do any good to my fellow men. It is absurd thus to talk. It is absurd to disconnect them. This is a wonderfully great life, and you ought to spend your time getting money, because of the power there is in money. And yet this religious prejudice is so great that some people think it is a great honor to be one of God's poor. I am looking in the faces of people who think just that way. I heard a man once say in a prayer meeting that he was thankful that he was one of God's poor, and then I silently wondered what his wife would say to that speech, as she took in washing to support the man while he sat and smoked on the veranda. I don't want to see any more of that land of God's poor. 
Now, when a man could have been rich just as well, and he is now weak because he is poor, he has done some great wrong, he has been untruthful to himself, he has been unkind to his fellow men. We ought to get rich if we can by honorable and Christian methods, and these are the only methods that sweep us quickly toward the goal of riches. I remember, not many years ago a young theological student who came into my office and said to me that he thought it was his duty to come in and labor with me. I asked him what had happened, and he said, I feel it is my duty to come in and speak to you, sir, and say that the Holy Scriptures declare that money is the root of all evil. I asked him where he found that saying, and he said he found it in the Bible. I asked him whether he had made a new Bible, and he said, no, he had not gotten a new Bible, that it was in the old Bible. Well, I said, if it is in my Bible, I never saw it. Will you please get the text book and let me see it? He left the room and soon came stalking in with his Bible open, with all the bigoted pride of the narrow sectarian, who founds his creed on some misinterpretation of scripture, and he put the Bible down on the table before me and fairly squealed into my ear, there it is. You can read it for yourself. I said to him, young man, you will learn, when you get a little older, that you cannot trust another denomination to read the Bible for you. I said, now, you belong to another denomination. Please read it to me, and remember that you are taught in a school where emphasis is exegesis. So he took the Bible and read it, the Love of money is the root of all evil. Then he had it right. The great book has come back into the esteem and love of the people, and into the respect of the greatest minds of earth, and now you can quote it and rest your life and your death on it without more fear. So, when he quoted right from the scriptures he quoted the truth. The love of money is the root of all evil. Oh, that is it. It is the worship of the means instead of the end, though you cannot reach the end without the means. When a man makes an idol of the money instead of the purposes for which it may be used, when he squeezes the dollar until the eagle squeals, then it is made the root of all evil. Think, if you only had the money, what you could do for your wife, your child, and for your home and your city. Think how soon you could endow the temple college yonder if you only had the money and the disposition to give it, and yet, my friend, people say you and I should not spend the time getting rich. How inconsistent the whole thing is. We ought to be rich, because money has power. I think the best thing for me to do is to illustrate this, for if I say you ought to get rich, I ought, at least, to suggest how it is done. We get a prejudice against rich men because of the lies that are told about them. The lies that are told about Mr. Rockefeller because he has $200 million, so many believe them, yet how false is the representation of that man to the world. How little we can tell what is true nowadays when newspapers try to sell their papers entirely on some sensation. The way they lie about the rich men is something terrible, and I do not know that there is anything to illustrate this better than what the newspapers now say about the city of Philadelphia. A young man came to me the other day and said, If Mr. Rockefeller, as you think, is a good man, why is it that everybody says so much against him? It is because he has gotten ahead of us, that is the whole of it, just gotten ahead of us. Why is it Mr. Carnegie is criticized so sharply by an envious world? Because he has gotten more than we have. If a man knows more than I know, don't I incline to criticize somewhat his learning? Let a man stand in a pulpit and preach to thousands, and if I have fifteen people in my church, and they're all asleep, don't I criticize him? We always do that to the man who gets ahead of us. Why, the man you are criticizing has one hundred millions, and you have fifty cents, and both of you have just what you are worth. One of the richest men in this country came into my home and sat down in my parlor and said, Did you see all those lies about my family in the paper? Certainly I did, I knew they were lies when I saw them. Why do they lie about me the way they do? Well, I said to him, If you will give me your check for one hundred millions, I will take all the lies along with it. Well, said he, I don't see any sense in their thus talking about my family and myself. Conwell, tell me frankly, what do you think the American people think of me? Well, said I, they think you are the blackest-hearted villain that ever trod the soil. 
but what can I do about it? There is nothing he can do about it, and yet he is one of the sweetest Christian men I ever knew. If you get a hundred millions you will have the lies, you will be lied about, and you can judge your success in any line by the lies that are told about you. I say that you ought to be rich. But there are ever coming to me young men who say, I would like to go into business, but I cannot. Why not? Because I have no capital to begin on. Capital, capital to begin on. What? Young man. Living in Philadelphia and looking at this wealthy generation, all of whom began as poor boys, and you want capital to begin on. It is fortunate for you that you have no capital. I am glad you have no money. I pity a rich man's son. A rich man's son in these days of ours occupies a very difficult position. They are to be pitied. A rich man's son cannot know the very best things in human life. He cannot. The statistics of Massachusetts show us that not one out of seventeen rich men's sons ever die rich. They are raised in luxury, they die in poverty. Even if a rich man's son retains his father's money even then he cannot know the best things of life. A young man in our college yonder asked me to formulate for him what I thought was the happiest hour in a man's history, and I studied it long and came back convinced that the happiest hour that any man ever sees in any earthly matter is when a young man takes his bride over the threshold of the door, for the first time, of the house he himself has earned and built. When he turns to his bride and with an eloquence greater than any language of mine, he saith to his wife, My loved one, I earned. This home myself, I earned it all. It is all mine, and I divide it with thee. That is the grandest moment a human heart may ever see. But a rich man's son cannot know that. He goes into a finer mansion, it may be, but he is obliged to go through the house and say, Mother gave me this, mother gave me that, my mother gave me that, my mother gave me that, until his wife wishes she had married his mother. Oh, I pity a rich man's son. I do. Until he gets so far along in his dudism that he gets his arms up like that and can't get them down. Didn't you ever see any of them astray at Atlantic City? I saw one of these scarecrows once and I never tire thinking about it. I was at Niagara Falls lecturing, and after the lecture I went to the hotel, and when I went up to the desk there stood there a millionaire's son from New York. He was an indescribable specimen of anthropologic potency. He carried a gold-headed cane under his arm, more in its head than he had in his. I do not believe I could describe the young man if I should try. But still I must say that he wore an eye glass he could not see through, patent leather shoes he could not walk in, and pants he could not sit down in, dressed like a grasshopper. Well, this human cricket came up to the clerk's desk just as I came in. He adjusted his unseeing eye glass in this wise and lisped to the clerk, because it's, English, you know, to lisp, thur, thur, will you have the kindness to furnish me with Tommy Papa and Tommy Envelopes. The clerk measured that man quick, and he pulled out a drawer and took some envelopes and paper and cast them across the counter and turned away to his books. You should have seen that specimen of humanity when the paper and envelopes came across the counter, he whose wants had always been anticipated by servants. He adjusted his unseeing eye glass and he yelled after that clerk, Come back here, Thur, come right back here. Now, Thur, will you order a servant to take that papa and though the envelopes and carry them to yonder desk? Oh, the poor miserable, contemptible American monkey. He couldn't carry paper and envelopes twenty feet. I suppose he could not get his arms down. I have no pity for such travesties of human nature. If you have no capital, I am glad of it. You don't need capital, you need common sense, not copper sense. A. T. Stewart, the great princely merchant of New York, the richest man in America in his time, was a poor boy, he had a dollar and a half and went into the mercantile business. But he lost eighty-seven and a half cents of his first dollar and a half because he bought some needles and thread and buttons to sell, which people didn't want. Are you poor? It is because you are not wanted and are left on your own hands. There was the great lesson. 
Apply it whichever way you will it comes to every single person's life, young or old. He did not know what people needed, and consequently bought something they didn't want and had the goods left on his hands a dead loss. A.T. Stewart learned there the great lesson of his mercantile life and said, I will never buy anything more until I first learn what the people want, then I'll make the purchase. He went around to the doors and asked them what they did want, and when he found out what they wanted, he invested his sixty-two and a half cents and began to supply a known demand. I care not what your profession or occupation in life may be, I care not whether you are a lawyer, a doctor, a housekeeper, teacher or whatever else, the principle is precisely the same. We must know what the world needs first and then invest ourselves to supply that need, and success is almost certain. A.T. Stewart went on until he was worth forty millions. Well, you will say, a man can do that in New York, but cannot do it here in Philadelphia. The statistics very carefully gathered in New York in 1889 showed 107 millionaires in the city worth over 10 millions apiece. It was remarkable and people think they must go there to get rich. Out of that 107 millionaires only seven of them made their money in New York, and the others moved to New York after their fortunes were made, and 67 out of the remaining hundred made their fortunes in towns of less than 6,000 people, and the richest man in the country at that time lived in a town of 3,500 inhabitants, and always lived there and never moved away. It is not so much where you are as what you are. But at the same time if the largeness of the city comes into the problem, then remember it is the smaller city that furnishes the great opportunity to make the millions of money. The best illustration that I can give is in reference to John Jacob Astor, who was a poor boy and who made all the money of the Astor family. He made more than his successors have ever earned, and yet he once held a mortgage on a millinery store in New York, and because the people could not make enough money to pay the interest and the rent, he foreclosed the mortgage and took possession of the store and went into partnership with the man who had failed. He kept the same stock, did not give them a dollar capital, and he left them alone and went out and sat down upon a bench in the park. Out there on that bench in the park he had the most important, and to my mind, the pleasantest part of that partnership business. He was watching the ladies as they went by, and where is the man that wouldn't get rich at that business? But when John Jacob Astor saw a lady pass, with her shoulders back and her head up, as if she did not care if the whole world looked on her, he studied her bonnet, and before that bonnet was out of sight he knew the shape of the frame and the color of the trimmings, the curl of the, something on a bonnet. Sometimes I try to describe a woman's bonnet, but it is of little use, for it would be out of style to morrow night. So John Jacob Astor went to the store and said, Now, put in the show window just such a bonnet as I described to you because, said he, I have just seen a lady who likes just such a bonnet. Do not make up any more till I come back. And he went out again and sat on that bench in the park, and another lady of a different form and complexion passed him with a bonnet of different shape and color, of course. Now, said he, put such a bonnet as that in the show window. He didn't fill his show window with hats and bonnets which drive people away and then sit in the back of the store and ball because the people go somewhere else to trade. He didn't put a hat or bonnet in that show window the like of which he had not seen before it was made up. In our city especially there are great opportunities for manufacturing, and the time has come when the line is drawn very sharply between the stockholders of the factory and their employees. Now, friends, there has also come a discouraging gloom upon this country and the laboring men are beginning to feel that they are being held down by a crust over their heads through which they find it impossible to break and the aristocratic money owner himself is so far above that he will never descend to their assistance. That is the thought that is in the minds of our people. But, friends, never in the history of our country was there an opportunity so great for the poor man to get rich as there is now in the city of Philadelphia. The very fact that they get discouraged is what prevents them from getting rich. That is all there is to it. The road is open, and let us keep it open between the poor and the rich. I know that the labor unions have two great problems to contend with, and there is only one way to solve them. The labor unions are doing as much to prevent its solving as are the capitalists to day, 
and there are positively two sides to it. The labor union has two difficulties, the first one is that it began to make a labor scale for all classes on a par, and they scale down a man that can earn five dollars a day to two and a half a day, in order to level up to him an imbecile that cannot earn fifty cents a day. That is one of the most dangerous and discouraging things for the working man. He cannot get the results of his work if he do better work or higher work or work longer, that is a dangerous thing, and in order to get every laboring man free and every American equal to every other American, let the laboring man ask what he is worth and get it, not let any capitalist say to him, you shall work for me for half of what you are worth, nor let any labor organization say, you shall work for the capitalist for half your worth. Be a man, be independent, and then shall the laboring man find the road ever open from poverty to wealth. The other difficulty that the labor union has to consider, and this problem they have to solve themselves, is the kind of orators who come and talk to them about the oppressive rich. I can in my dreams recite the oration I have heard again and again under such circumstances. My life has been with the laboring man. I am a laboring man myself. I have often, in their assemblies, heard the speech of the man who has been invited to address the labor union. The man gets up before the assembled company of honest laboring men and he begins by saying, Oh, ye honest, industrious laboring men, who have furnished all the capital of the world, who have built all the palaces and constructed all the railroads and covered the ocean with her steamships. Oh, you laboring men! You are nothing but slaves, you are ground down in the dust by the capitalist who is gloating over you as he enjoys his beautiful estates and as he has his banks filled with gold, and every dollar he owns is coined out of the heart's blood of the honest laboring man. Now, that is a lie, and you know it is a lie, and yet that is the kind of speech that they are all the time hearing, representing the capitalists as wicked and the laboring men so enslaved. Why, how wrong it is! Let the man who loves his flag and believes in American principles endeavor with all his soul to bring the capitalist and the laboring man together until they stand side by side, and arm in arm, and work for the common good of humanity. He is an enemy to his country who sets capital against labor or labor against capital. Suppose I were to go down through this audience and ask you to introduce me to the great inventors who live here in Philadelphia. The inventors of Philadelphia, you would say, why we don't have any in Philadelphia. It is too slow to invent anything. But you do have just as great inventors, and they are here in this audience, as ever invented a machine. But the probability is that the greatest inventor to benefit the world with his discovery is some person, perhaps some lady, who thinks she could not invent anything. Did you ever study the history of invention and see how strange it was that the man who made the greatest discovery did it without any previous idea that he was an inventor? Who are the great inventors? They are persons with plain, straightforward common sense, who saw a need in the world and immediately applied themselves to supply that need. If you want to invent anything, don't try to find it in the wheels in your head nor the wheels in your machine, but first find out what the people need, and then apply yourself to that need, and this leads to invention on the part of the people you would not dream of before. The great inventors are simply great men, the greater the man the more simple the man, and the more simple a machine, the more valuable it is. Did you ever know a really great man? His ways are so simple, so common, so plain, that you think anyone could do what he is doing. So it is with the great men the world over. If you know a really great man, a neighbor of yours, you can go right up to him and say, How are you, Jim, good morning, Sam. Of course you can, for they are always so simple. When I wrote The Life of General Garfield, one of his neighbors took me to his back door, and shouted, Jim, 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 and very soon, Jim, came to the door and General Garfield let me in, one of the grandest men of our century. The great men of the world are ever so. I was down in Virginia and went up to an educational institution and was directed to a man who was setting out a tree. I approached him and said, do you think it would be possible for me to see General Robert E. Lee, the president of the university? He said, sir, I am General Lee. Of course, when you meet such a man, 
so noble a man as that, you will find him a simple, plain man. Greatness is always just so modest and great inventions are simple. I asked a class in school once who were the great inventors, and a little girl popped up and said, Columbus. Well, now, she was not so far wrong. Columbus bought a farm and he carried on that farm just as I carried on my father's farm. He took a hoe and went out and sat down on a rock. But Columbus, as he sat upon that shore and looked out upon the ocean, noticed that the ships, as they sailed away, sank deeper into the sea the farther they went. And since that time some other, Spanish ships, have sunk into the sea. But as Columbus noticed that the tops of the masts dropped down out of sight, he said, that is the way it is with this whole handle, if you go around this whole handle, the farther off you go the farther down you go. I can sail around to the East Indies. How plain it all was. How simple the mind, majestic like the simplicity of a mountain in its greatness. Who are the great inventors? They are ever the simple, plain, everyday people who see the need and set about to supply it. I was once lecturing in North Carolina, and the cashier of the bank sat directly behind a lady who wore a very large hat. I said to that audience, your wealth is too near to you, you are looking right over it. He whispered to his friend, well, then, my wealth is in that hat. A little later, as he wrote me, I said, Wherever there is a human need there is a greater fortune than a mind can furnish. He caught my thought, and he drew up his plan for a better hat pin than was in the hat before him, and the pin is now being manufactured. He was offered fifty, five thousand dollars for his patent. That man made his fortune before he got out of that hall. This is the whole question, do you see a need? I remember well a man up in my native hills, a poor man, who for twenty years was helped by the town in his poverty, who owned a wide, spreading maple tree that covered the poor man's cottage like a benediction from on high. I remember that tree, for in the spring, there were some roguish boys around that neighborhood when I was young, in the spring of the year the man would put a bucket there and the spouts to catch the maple sap, and I remember where that bucket was, and when I was young the boys were, oh, so mean that they went to that tree before that man had gotten out of bed in the morning, and after he had gone to bed at night, and drank up that sweet sap. I could swear they did it. He didn't make a great deal of maple sugar from that tree. But one day he made the sugar so white and crystalline that the visitor did not believe it was maple sugar, thought maple sugar must be red or black. He said to the old man, why don't you make it that way and sell it for confectionery? The old man caught his thought and invented the rock maple crystal, and before that patent expired he had ninety thousand dollars and had built a beautiful palace on the site of that tree. After forty years owning that tree he awoke to find it had fortunes of money indeed in it. And many of us are right by the tree that has a fortune for us, and we own it, possess it, do what we will with it, but we do not learn its value because we do not see the human need, and in these discoveries and inventions this is one of the most romantic things of life. I have received letters from all over the country and from England, where I have lectured, saying that they have discovered this and that, and one man out in Ohio took me through his great factories last spring, and said that they cost him $680,000, and said he, I was not worth a cent in the world when I heard your lecture Acres of Diamonds, but I made up my mind to stop right here and make my fortune here. And here it is. He showed me through his unmortgaged possessions. And this is a continual experience now as I travel through the country, after these many years. I mention this incident, not to boast, but to show you that you can do the same if you will. Who are the great inventors? I remember a good illustration in a man who used to live in East Brookfield, Massachusetts. He was a shoemaker, and he was out of work, and he sat around the house until his wife told him to go outdoors. And he did what every husband is compelled by law to do, he obeyed his wife. And he went out and sat down on an ash barrel in his backyard. Think of it. Stranded on an ash barrel and the enemy in possession of the house. As he sat on that ash barrel, he looked down into that little brook which ran through that backyard into the meadows, 
and he saw a little trout go flashing up the stream and hiding under the bank. I do not suppose he thought of Tennyson's beautiful poem. Chatter, chatter, as I flow, to join the brimming river, men may come, and men may go, but I go on forever. But as this man looked into the brook, he leaped off that ash barrel and managed to catch the trout with his fingers, and send it to Worcester. They wrote back that they would give him a five dollar bill for another such trout as that, not that it was worth that much, but they wished to help the poor man. So this shoemaker and his wife, now perfectly united, that five dollar bill in prospect, went out to get another trout. They went up the stream to its source and down to the brimming river, but not another trout could they find in the whole stream, and so they came home disconsolate and went to the minister. The minister didn't know how trout grew, but he pointed the way. Said he, get Seth Green's book, and that will give you the information you want. They did so, and found all about the culture of trout. They found that a trout lays 30, 600 eggs every year and every trout gains a quarter of a pound every year, so that in four years a little trout will furnish four tons per annum to sell to the market at 50 cents a pound. When they found that, they said they didn't believe any such story as that, but if they could get five dollars apiece they could make something. And right in that same backyard with the coal sifter upstream and window screen down the stream, they began the culture of trout. They afterwards moved to the Hudson, and since then he has become the authority in the United States upon the raising of fish, and he has been next to the highest on the United States Fish Commission in Washington. My lesson is that man's wealth was out there in his backyard for twenty years, but he didn't see it until his wife drove him out with a mop stick. I remember meeting personally a poor carpenter of Hingham, Massachusetts, who was out of work and in poverty. His wife also drove him out of doors. He sat down on the shore and whittled a soaked shingle into a wooden chain. His children quarreled over it in the evening, and while he was whittling a second one, a neighbor came along and said, why don't you whittle toys if you can carve like that? He said, I don't know what to make. There is the whole thing. His neighbor said to him, why don't you ask your own children? Said he, what is the use of doing that? My children are different from other people's children. I used to see people like that when I taught school. The next morning when his boy came down the stairway, he said, Sam, what do you want for a toy? I want a wheelbarrow. When his little girl came down, he asked her what she wanted, and she said, I want a little doll's washstand, a little doll's carriage, a little doll's umbrella, and went on with a whole lot of things that would have taken his lifetime to supply. He consulted his own children right there in his own house and began to whittle out toys to please them. He began with his jack, knife, and made those unpainted Hingham toys. He is the richest man in the entire New England states, if Mr. Lawson is to be trusted in his statement concerning such things, and yet that man's fortune was made by consulting his own children in his own house. You don't need to go out of your own house to find out what to invent or what to make. I always talk too long on this subject. I would like to meet the great men who are here tonight. The great men. We don't have any great men in Philadelphia. Great men. You say that they all come from London, or San Francisco, or Rome, or Maniunk, or anywhere else but here, anywhere else but Philadelphia, and yet, in fact, there are just as great men in Philadelphia as in any city of its size. There are great men and women in this audience. Great men, I have said, are very simple men. Just as many great men here as are to be found anywhere. The greatest error in judging great men is that we think that they always hold an office. The world knows nothing of its greatest men. Who are the great men of the world? The young man and young woman may well ask the question. It is not necessary that they should hold an office, and yet that is the popular idea. That is the idea we teach now in our high schools and common schools, that the great men of the world are those who hold some high office, and unless we change that very soon and do away with that prejudice, we are going to change to an empire. There is no question about it. We must teach that men are great only on their intrinsic value, and not on the position that they may incidentally happen to occupy. 
And yet, don't blame the young men saying that they are going to be great when they get into some official position. I ask this audience again who of you are going to be great? Says a young man, I am going to be great. When are you going to be great? When I am elected to some political office. Won't you learn the lesson, young man, that it is? Prima facie evidence of littleness to hold public office under our form of government? Think of it. This is a government of the people, and by the people, and for the people, and not for the office holder, and if the people in this country rule as they always should rule, an office holder is only the servant of the people, and the Bible says that, the servant cannot be greater than his master. The Bible says that, he that is sent cannot be greater than him who sent him. In this country the people are the masters, and the office holders can never be greater than the people, they should be honest servants of the people, but they are not our greatest men. Young man, remember that you never heard of a great man holding any political office in this country unless he took that office at an expense to himself. It is a loss to every great man to take a public office in our country. Bear this in mind, young man, that you cannot be made great by a political election. Another young man says, I am going to be a great man in Philadelphia sometime. Is that so? When are you going to be great? When there comes another war. When we get into difficulty with Mexico, or England, or Russia, or Japan, or with Spain again over Cuba, or with New Jersey, I will march up to the cannon's mouth, and amid the glistening bayonets I will tear down their flag from its staff, and I will come home with stars on my shoulders, and hold every office in the gift of the government, and I will be great. No, you won't. No, you won't, that is no evidence of true greatness, young man. But don't blame that young man for thinking that way, that is the way he is taught in the high school. That is the way history is taught in college. He is taught that the men who held the office did all the fighting. I remember we had a peace jubilee here in Philadelphia soon after the Spanish War. Perhaps some of these visitors think we should not have had it until now in Philadelphia, and as the great procession was going up Broad Street I was told that the tally ho coach stopped right in front of my house, and on the coach was Hobson, and all the people threw up their hats and swung their handkerchiefs, and shouted, hurrah for Hobson. I would have yelled too, because he deserves much more of his country than he has ever received. But suppose I go into the high school tomorrow and ask, boys, who sunk the Merrimack? If they answer me, Hobson, they tell me seven-eighths of a lie, seven-eighths of a lie, because there were eight men who sunk the Merrimack. The other seven men, by virtue of their position, were continually exposed to the Spanish fire, while Hobson, as an officer, might reasonably be behind the smoke stack. Why, my friends, in this intelligent audience gathered here to night I do not believe I could find a single person that can name the other seven men who were with Hobson. Why do we teach history in that way? We ought to teach that however humble the station a man may occupy, if he does his full duty in his place, he is just as much entitled to the American people's honor as is a king upon a throne. We do teach it as a mother did her little boy in New York when he said, Mama, what great building is that? That is General Grant's tomb. Who was General Grant? He was the man who put down the rebellion. Is that the way to teach history? Do you think we would have gained a victory if it had depended on General Grant alone? Oh, no. Then why is there a tomb on the Hudson at all? Why, not simply because General Grant was personally a great man himself, but that tomb is there because he was a representative man and represented 200,000 men who went down to death for their nation and many of them as great as General Grant. That is why that beautiful tomb stands on the heights over the Hudson. I remember an incident that will illustrate this, the only one that I can give to tonight. I am ashamed of it, but I don't dare leave it out. I close my eyes now, I look back through the years to 1863, I can see my native town in the Berkshire Hills, I can see that cattle show ground filled with people, I can see the church there and the town hall crowded, and hear bands playing, and see flags flying and handkerchiefs streaming, well do I recall at this moment that day. The people had turned out to receive a company of soldiers, 
and that company came marching up on the common. They had served out one term in the Civil War and had re-enlisted, and they were being received by their native townsmen. I was but a boy, but I was captain of that company, puffed out with pride on that day, why, a cambric needle would have burst me all to pieces. As I marched on the common at the head of my company, there was not a man more proud than I. We marched into the town hall and then they seated my soldiers down in the center of the house and I took my place down on the front seat, and then the town officers filed through the great throng of people, who stood close and packed in that little hall. They came up on the platform, formed a half circle around it, and the mayor of the town, the chairman of the selectmen, in New England, took his seat in the middle of that half circle. He was an old man, his hair was gray, he never held an office before in his life. He thought that an office was all he needed to be a truly great man, and when he came up he adjusted his powerful spectacles and glanced calmly around the audience with amazing dignity. Suddenly his eyes fell upon me, and then the good old man came right forward and invited me to come up on the stand with the town officers. Invited me up on the stand. No town officer ever took notice of me before I went to war. Now, I should not say that. One town officer was there who advised the teacher to wail to me, but I mean no honorable mention. So I was invited up on the stand with the town officers. I took my seat and let my sword fall on the floor, and folded my arms across my breast and waited to be received. Napoleon V. Pride goeth before destruction and a fall. When I had gotten my seat and all became silent through the hall, the chairman of the selectmen arose and came forward with great dignity to the table, and we all supposed he would introduce the congregational minister, who was the only orator in the town, and who would give the oration to the returning soldiers. But, friends, you should have seen the surprise that ran over that audience when they discovered that this old farmer was going to deliver that oration himself. He had never made a speech in his life before, but he fell into the same error that others have fallen into, he seemed to think that the office would make him an orator. So he had written out a speech and walked up and down the pasture until he had learned it by heart and frightened the cattle, and he brought that manuscript with him, and taking it from his pocket, he spread it carefully upon the table. Then he adjusted his spectacles to be sure that he might see it, and walked far back on the platform and then stepped forward like this. He must have studied the subject much, for he assumed an elocutionary attitude, he rested heavily upon his left heel, slightly advanced the right foot, threw back his shoulders, opened the organs of speech, and advanced his right hand at an angle of forty-five. As he stood in that elocutionary attitude this is just the way that speech went, this is it precisely. Some of my friends have asked me if I do not exaggerate it, but I could not exaggerate it. Impossible. This is the way it went, although I am not here for the story but the lesson that is back of it. Fellow citizens. As soon as he heard his voice, his hand began to shake like that, his knees began to tremble, and then he shook all over. He coughed and choked and finally came around to look at his manuscript. Then he began again, fellow citizens, we, are, we are, we are, we are, we are very happy, we are very happy, we are very happy, to welcome back to their native town these soldiers who have fought and bled, and come back again to their native town. We are especially, we are especially, we are especially, we are especially pleased to see with us to, day this young hero, that meant me, this young hero who in imagination, friends, remember, he said, imagination, for if he had not said that, I would not be egotistical enough to refer to it, this young hero who, in imagination, we have seen leading his troops, leading, we have seen leading, we have seen leading his troops on to the deadly breach. We have seen his shining, his shining, we have seen his shining, we have seen his shining, his shining sword, flashing in the sunlight as he shouted to his troops, come on. Oh, dear, 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 dear. How little that good, old man knew about war. If he had known anything about war, he ought to have known what any soldier in this audience knows is true, that it is next to a crime for an officer of infantry ever in time of danger to go ahead of his men. I, with my shining sword flashing in the sunlight, shouting to my troops, come on. 
I never did it. Do you suppose I would go ahead of my men to be shot in the front by the enemy and in the back by my own men? That is no place for an officer. The place for the officer is behind the private soldier in actual fighting. How often, as a staff officer, I rode down the line when the rebel cry and yell was coming out of the woods, sweeping along over the fields, and shouted, officers to the rear. Officers to the rear, and then every officer goes behind the line of battle, and the higher the officer's rank, the farther behind he goes. Not because he is any the less brave, but because the laws of war require that to be done. If the general came up on the front line and were killed you would lose your battle anyhow, because he has the plan of the battle in his brain, and must be kept in comparative safety. I, with my, shining sword flashing in the sunlight. Ah! There sat in the hall that day men who had given that boy their last hard tack, who had carried him on their backs through deep rivers. But some were not there, they had gone down to death for their country. The speaker mentioned them, but they were but little noticed, and yet they had gone down to death for their country, gone down for a cause they believed was right and still believe was right, though I grant to the other side the same that I ask for myself. Yet these men who had actually died for their country were little noticed, and the hero of the hour was this boy. Why was he the hero? Simply because that man fell into that same foolishness. This boy was an officer, and those were only private soldiers. I learned a lesson that I will never forget. Greatness consists not in holding some office, greatness really consists in doing some great deed with little means, in the accomplishment of vast purposes from the private ranks of life, that is true greatness. He who can give to this people better streets, better homes, better schools, better churches, more religion, more of happiness, more of God, he that can be a blessing to the community in which he lives to night will be great anywhere, but he who cannot be a blessing where he now lives will never be great anywhere on the face of God's earth. We live in deeds, not years, in feeling, not in figures on a dial, in thoughts, not breaths, we should count time by heart throbs, in the cause of right. Bailey says, he most lives who thinks most. If you forget everything I have said to you, do not forget this, because it contains more in two lines than all I have said. Bailey says, he most lives who thinks most, who feels the noblest, and who acts the best. Victor Hugo Honoré de Balzac Delivered at the funeral of Balzac, August 20, 1850 Gentlemen, the man who now goes down into this tomb is one of those to whom public grief pays homage. In one day all fictions have vanished. The eye is fixed not only on the heads that reign, but on heads that think, and the whole country is moved when one of those heads disappears. Today we have a people in black because of the death of the man of talent, a nation in mourning for a man of genius. Gentlemen, the name of Balzac will be mingled in the luminous trace our epoch will leave across the future. Balzac was one of that powerful generation of writers of the 19th century who came after Napoleon, as the illustrious Pleiad of the 17th century came after Richelieu, as if in the development of civilization there were a law which gives conquerors by the intellect as successors to conquerors by the sword. Balzac was one of the first among the greatest, one of the highest among the best. This is not the place to tell all that constituted this splendid and sovereign intelligence. All his books form but one book, a book living, luminous, profound, where one sees coming and going and marching and moving, with I know not what of the formidable and terrible, mixed with the real, all our contemporary civilization, a marvelous book which the poet entitled, A Comedy, and which he could have called History, which takes all forms and all style, which surpasses Tacitus and Suetonius, which traverses Beaumarchais and reaches Rabelais, a book which realizes observation and Imagination, which lavishes the true, the esoteric, the commonplace, the trivial, the material, and which at times through all realities, swiftly and grandly rent away, allows us all at once a glimpse of a most somber and tragic ideal. Unknown to himself, whether he wished it or not, whether he consented or not, the author of this immense and strange work is one of the strong race of revolutionist writers. 
Balzac goes straight to the goal. Body to body he seizes modern society, from all he rests something, from these an illusion, from those a hope, from one a catch, word, from another a mask. He ransacked vice, he dissected passion. He searched out and sounded man, soul, heart, entrails, brain, the abyss that each one has within himself. And by grace of his free and vigorous nature, by a privilege of the intellect of our time, which, having seen revolutions face to face, can see more clearly the destiny of humanity and comprehend providence better, Balzac redeemed himself smiling and severe from those formidable studies which produced melancholy in Moliere and misanthropy in Rousseau. This is what he has accomplished among us, this is the work which he has left us, a work lofty and solid, a monument robustly piled in layers of granite, from the height of which hereafter his renown shall shine in splendor. Great men make their own pedestal, the future will be answerable for the statue. His death stupefied Paris. Only a few months ago he had come back to France. Feeling that he was dying, he wished to see his country again, as one who would embrace his mother on the eve of a distant voyage. His life was short, but full, more filled with deeds than days. Alas! This powerful worker, never fatigued, this philosopher, this thinker, this poet, this genius, has lived among us that life of storm, of strife, of quarrels and combats, common in all times to all great men. Today he is at peace. He escapes contention and hatred. On the same day he enters into glory and the tomb. Thereafter beyond the clouds, which are above our heads, he will shine among the stars of his country. All you who are here, are you not tempted to envy him? Whatever may be our grief in presence of such a loss, let us accept these catastrophes with resignation. Let us accept in it whatever is distressing and severe, it is good perhaps, it is necessary perhaps, in an epoch like ours, that from time to time the great dead shall communicate to spirits devoured with skepticism and doubt, a religious fervor. Providence knows what it does when it puts the people face to face with the supreme mystery and when it gives them death to reflect on, death which is supreme equality, as it is also supreme liberty. Providence knows what it does, since it is the greatest of all instructors. There can be but austere and serious thoughts in all hearts when a sublime spirit makes its majestic entrance into another life, when one of those beings who have long soared above the crowd on the visible wings of genius, spreading all at once other wings which we did not see, plunges swiftly into the unknown. No, it is not the unknown, no, I have said it on another sad occasion and I shall repeat it to day, it is not night, it is light. It is not the end, it is the beginning. It is not extinction, it is eternity. Is it not true, my hearers, such tombs as this demonstrate immortality? In presence of the illustrious dead, we feel more distinctly the divine destiny of that intelligence which traverses the earth to suffer and to purify itself, which we call man. The End